DIYers, 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 make your way on in. I hope you're doing well on this Sunday. So glad, excuse me, Saturday. Good to have you join us. Got a special guest today, ladies and gentlemen. We've been in here chopping it up. Make sure as you make your way in here, and turn this music down really quick. Make sure as you make your way in here, you hit that like button. Let the rest of our friends and family and DIYers know that we are getting ready to go live. share this really quick to Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> there it is. Boom. All right, DIYers, 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 we're going to get started right now. DIY. DIYers, welcome, welcome in. Welcome in. First and foremost, thank you for choosing to watch today. I am joined today by a special guest that it's it's really wild. The amount of stories that I have that are connected to your name without even knowing it. It's our first time meeting. Yes. Uh, Paul Stewart, first and foremost. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for, for Paul Stewart, first and foremost. First time meeting. Thanks for having me. Big, big fan of the show, though. Thank you. Thank you. And it's going to sound really weird when I say, before I met you, I, I, I've said your name many times. <laughs> Shout out to Montel Jordan. And uh, this is how we do it. Meta DJ and Paul is his name. I had, had no idea. As a kid going to Little League, uh, in in Delamo, California, and my dad is bumping this and playing this in his Toyota Camry, and this is my pump up music, right? I'm getting ready to go out here. Had no idea that uh, I'd be sitting in front of this gentleman. That at the time I had no idea just how many different segments of hip hop you were influencing. But before we get into all of that good stuff, first and foremost, sir, how you doing today? Oh man, I'm great. Like I said, I was excited to be here. I'm a big fan of the show. Uh, I've been soaking up the knowledge. You know, uh, soaking up knowledge from me. Yeah, I, no man, way, yeah, no man. way. I'm soaking up knowledge from you. This yeah, yeah. is it's crazy. No, but I'm excited <laughs> to be here, though. Excited to work with you. Absolutely. Uh, let me make sure I acknowledge some of the good folks in here. Shout out to my moderators, Courtney. Thank you so much for holding it down. SS Stacks. Uh, I think that's Creator or Creator. Chris A.K. Uh, Meninja Fourth. Just Jux. And join us on a, on a Saturday. Flaw the Rugrat. Flaw the Rugrat. Good to see you guys in here. Uh, we getting ready to get it get it started. You like that poll? I, I had a poll up here to tell them if whether or not they liked the video yet, and the, the options are yes, I did, or secondly, it was um, no, I didn't, but I'll do it right now. And the third one was I had almond milk this morning. I just <laughs> just something to help them, you know, help it have a little bit more stickability. But I, uh, for those who don't know who Paul Stewart is, before we get into this conversation, I would love to share this trailer. Sure. For your story that is uh, in the process, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But uh, I think this this trailer would do a great job of helping you to understand uh, the amount of history and influence b uh, before and currently that is sitting in front of us. So I want to play this video really quick, ladies and gentlemen. The trailer for the white boy from Crenshaw. Here we go. How'd you hook up with Def Jam? I hooked up with a DJ named Paul Stewart back in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. He heard my stuff. I was singing, but I was singing over a lot of hip hop tracks. So rather than take me to like an R&B type label, that he would try and take me to a hip hop label. And what it better worked. label than Def Jam? This is how we do so you start to hear about legendary folks that were behind the scenes. DJ Pete. If you don't know who Paul Stewart is, Paul Stewart, we got Warren B as first deal. He got far side their first deal. Remember Paul Stewart? Paul Stewart. Paul Stewart. Paul was the guy that set it up. Paul was his name. The DJ. 
within a week, there was like the bidding war over this demo. Paul Stewart. Straight power moves. White boy Paul Stewart? Yeah, that's right. He's, 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 he's a half nigga, though. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Snoop. to have a unique upbringing when my dad decided to buy a house in a black neighborhood at the height of what was called white flight from South LA. Amazing, man. That's, that is, you know, I, I, I was thinking about whether or not to share this, this comparison, because I mean this respectfully when sure. I say this, but I couldn't help but watch this and seeing all, for instance, I'm, I'm going to just mute this really quick. I couldn't help but see certain scenes, and I'm like, "Where's, where's the, uh, the NWA one?" Oh, right. It might have been a little bit before this one, right? Are there, yeah, that, that, that interview. I, I look at all these different scenes. I've seen ones where you're in the background for Pac. I couldn't help but think of a movie, Forrest Gump. Yeah, yeah. Where he's literally in every single one of these, like, you know, obviously for the movie, but you really live that. Where I'm looking at all of these legendary moments, and uh, obviously you're there for a reason. But for those who may have never heard of who Paul Stewart is, how would you describe? Oh, wow. Well, um, I was really blessed that, you know, my dad was kind of a crazy guy and he uh, he bought a house in Crenshaw when all the <laughs> white people were moving out with like a quickness that right. did live there, which weren't that many at all. But like he bought the house right after the Watts riots and there was like wow. this mass exodus, you know, of uh, of South Central L.A. So I was really blessed to grow up in black neighborhood, South L.A., Crenshaw, and that just affected me a lot. And I started DJing when I was in college got into street promotion, and then artists started coming to me going, hey, I, I want you to manage me. You're like the only person I know that kind of knows anyone in the industry or whatever. And right. I, you know, I had been DJing for a while, which really helped like hone my ear. You know, I think I had born with, you know, the blessing of just being able to, you know, understand good music or hear a hit, so to speak, you know. Right. And um, yeah, I just started discovering artists, uh, House of Pain, Farside, Coolio, Warren G., uh, Montel Jordan and yeah and and when I f was early getting started in that I met John Singleton and John Singleton uh, was impressed by what I was doing and hired me to music supervise Poetic Justice so Sheesh, yeah and that's such a classic like th th that was another connection that we talked about before off camera in that the music is so important for any piece of film any television show and it just amazes me how many soundtracks, either myself or my wife, we connected first on music. How many of those you've been connected to? One mm. in particular, uh, more recently, was the the Insecure mm. soundtrack. And your ear is just it's unrivaled. Oh, and, thank you, man. And when I think about some of the stories that led up to it, I, I, I thought about a few different ways to approach this conversation. But I really want to start with the uh, the street team error. Mm. Because I think there's so many lessons that you learned in that process that could benefit so many independent artists that are returning back to that. They're coming out the trunk with the promotion for their project, they're sure. going back to physical, uh, a certain segment of the independence. But in the beginning, uh, what even led you to kind of get into that space? Well, it's kind of a funny story. I mean, I was a um, young guy, had worked at Delicious Vinyl when um, they put out their early hits, uh, uh, Bust a Move by Young MC and Tone mm -hmm. Look. And I was doing, like, promotion and marketing. You know, so I was like a young guy in the music industry, you know, trying to find his way and everything. And I, I had a couple jobs. And then um, my friend got a label deal with Island, and he hired me. And then the, the label, you know, fell apart, and then I have a job. And so, uh, but I was friends with this DJ from K-Day. Uh, famous uh, mix master Curtis Harmon and he came to me and street promotion was very early stages and he said hey um, this company wants to hire me to do street promotion I you know I don't really know what to do whatever <laughs> like you know, do you want to do it with me right and I said sure let's do it and I printed up business cards and uh, like Curtis played it in the mix and then I went out to swap meets record stores clubs 
anywhere I could try to find, you know, somewhere to be impactful to promote the record, you know. Like I said, this yeah. time it was a retail market of people buying music at stores, so mm -hmm. this was the key thing you wanted people to do, so a lot of our promotion was based around stores and stuff. But we would just go to events where people were. We might pass out cassette samplers. Right. We might put out, we were putting up OPP stickers everywhere when that came <laughs> out. Um, you know, so, but st I think the, the the street promotion thing, yes, is as necessary as ever, and also online to take that concept virally. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean of what we were doing and 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 uh, uh, build your own viral street team. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But also, if you're starting locally, which is always a great idea, right? To try to build up that thing by physical presence. I think you don't want to just waste money and put product in places where people aren't going to appreciate it. So you you, you want to be careful about where you where you promote and how you uh, uh, do it. But you know, um, we were pretty aggressive with some of the like poster campaigns, and mm -hmm. it was more people that worked for me when I the company got bigger. Because at first it was just me, right? And then I had this whole company, <laughs> you know, of people working for me, uh, and some of those people were really aggressive and were like getting the police called on us because they were putting posters up in places, right? Like, yeah. And, and I, I wonder, you know, especially you you have self-titled, at least the documentary, White Boy from Crenshaw. Coming into this space, especially on a street team um, representing hip hop, was there ever like pushback as you're out here and, and kind of like putting these posters up? Are people having any questions about, you know, your connection to what's going on? I was pretty blessed, man. I mean, yeah. and also, too, like, you know, when you go to the hood and like people might have looked at me odd sometimes, but most people were just respecting that I was there doing, mm. you know, that I had the balls to go there or whatever, too, or that I was there. So if I'm in the community and I'm and I went to a lot of hood shit, I went to a lot of like swap meets and things like that and everything. Mm. Um, no, I got a lot of weird questions. Like people ask me if I was mixed, even though you know, I don't look mixed <laughs> at all. And they just never seen a white people in that environment because right. I understand LA was a lot less um it was a lot more segregated in that era too sure you know and what what era are we talking about specifically like what time period would you say this is ooh this is like the early 90s late 80s mm. like 80s early 90s you know and the street promoters that were in LA before me were great like Doug Young and Scotty Spencer dudes that were holding it down but they mm. were real like hood so what my what I did as my company became bigger because it was hip hop was changing we were also we went to the hood but we also promoted in Hollywood mm. and other places where mixed people that weren't uh, black or brown that were getting into hip hop would, would discover it right? and where the record companies executives would see it and things mm. like that too that were hiring us too you know but it was an emerging scene I mean, I worked for Wild Pitch. I was promoting, you know, Nas Live at the Barbecue and, 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 and oh. you know, like looking out the front door and these really underground hip hop records on these tiny labels. Right. They're having huge success in New York. And out here, we were helping them find that like niche core audience mm -hmm. because it wasn't like, you know, getting any kind of big push. It was, and it wasn't something that culturally was like huge out here or mm -hmm. anything that style of hip-hop at that time sure sure and, and, and i'm curious as we kind of trans transfer from that or, or uh, transition from that how relevant do you feel like a lot of the things that you learned during that process are now for those who are still promoting shows because you still see folks out there who are like a version of a street team maybe not as, as organized as what you had and what you were doing with your company but um there are people who are still out here, you know, stapling flyers here and there. But it's you, a great, it's a great, yeah. it's a great question. Well, like you always say, to be an independent artist right now, you have to treat it as a business, mm -hmm. right? And to be successful, like to have much hope of success, sure. And, and you know, and it's funny because this is not necessarily something new, but it's not something that's been talked about or sounds cool. So many people didn't promote it, but right. it sounds cool to be all organic and this and that. But <laughs> it's, that, it's not, it doesn't sound cool to have the team of people hardworking in the back so much, except right. if you're an independent artist doing it all yourself. That sounds really <laughs> cool, you know. But I think a lot of the lessons and things that I learned um, that are relevant are things that are just, you know, um, haven't changed, like, or a changing and adapting it to how things are now but mm -hmm. there is plenty 
Um, but obviously you have to see about how it affects, you know, the world today. You know right. what I mean? But kind of that like building a buzz locally, same thing, still mm. important. You know, I, I, I think um, to ignore, to do like street teamwork and ignore how important everything that is digital would be ridiculous. Sure. The whole sure. focus of it should be getting people to go to digital things and, you know, on this kind of thing and, and, and evangelizing people. But there is something about physical interaction, physical contact mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit, you know, um, you know, look, the goal now for independent artists is to stand out. You have all the tools at your disposal Everything. to be independent. You can release it independent. All the roadblocks that were before weren't there that aren't here now. But mm -hmm. but standing out from the you know hundred thousands of records that get dropped every day or whatever mm -hmm. you know is 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 the thing. So yeah, if if you're core focused on a local market, and 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 you can do some kind of street things there that that are gonna like hit your core demographic. Sure. Then it really makes sense. Yeah. I was having a discussion earlier on my Twitter account just about the necessity of physical and just how crazy mm. things are with all the new updates with Spotify and, you know, them creating a threshold at the top of the year for artists that have to reach this in order to get paid. And so I found this reverse royalty calculator and I was just kind of putting some perspective that's been already been out there. But I put this perspective out here of one ten dollar CD that I sell to one person. We know obviously CDs are not as sure. uh, much of the center focus, but one CD from having this, and I, I don't I think people underestimate how, how much easier it is when you connect with a human being eye to eye and you're able to say, hey, I have this CD for you. Uh, I just, you, I, you saw me perform and you, you were impacted by it, but that one CD is the equivalent to 2,800 and something odd streams on Spotify. And you have to hope that these people have premium accounts on Spotify and so there's a lot of people who are opening up to the idea. I don't know if you saw the stat that this was the first year that vinyl surpassed CD right. since 1987. So I think what you're sharing is so valuable because a lot of people are having to understand those uh, those foundational lessons. I think physical, for an independent artist in today's market, I think a physical product is a good thing. It could be t-shirts and things, for mm -hmm. sure, merch you gotta have, but it could also be a vinyl album, it could be CDs, mm -hmm. cassettes, you know. Yeah. I, I think having, uh, the thing is, you know, you gotta treat it like a business, right? So like you said, you're a small business, so if you're manufacturing those things, ooh, you gotta get your numbers right on, because if sure. you under, if you over, if you manufacture too many, there goes your profit. If you under manufacture, not as bad, but wasted potential at profit you could have had, right? <laughs> but you know, there's nothing worse. Yeah. Every independent artist knows this thing of that box of 12 inches sitting in the closet gathering mm -hmm. dust or whatever. Yeah, you know, that, that, sitting in a, in a garage right, that, that right. I would never buy again, because it's just tie-dye t-shirts that nobody wants right now <laughs> or ever <laughs> there, there's always these these things that's why i love like print on, when i started doing print on demand books and everything i was like whoa like yeah. you know that really turned oh, me on yeah. you know what i mean because you know just the like every piece of merch or every item sold as profit mm -hmm. you know is a really interesting uh model especially when you're controlling more of the profit than like on the streaming services when you have a piece of merch to sell that's like a book yeah. or a, a a shirt or something you know so yeah th those connections those those physical hand to hand those i remember your face i remember the conversation or the energy that come all those things it feels like people are understanding because of you know living in an air where everybody anybody could literally pop up and have four million tiktok followers anybody could pose as an expert on something uh it's always important to hear from those who have lived it but not only lived it in one era but multiple eras and you've seen so many different ebbs and flows of hip-hop in general w where i want to kind of start to transition to is uh you as a dj okay when did that switch from i guess focusing or was it at the same time that you were focusing street team and dj how did you kind of transition into that space they really they really complimented each other okay. because when I was doing street team I was actively DJing at some really big underground clubs in LA so I could mm -hmm. just play the record I knew all the DJs you know there were mm -hmm. and I was also promoting parties you know what I mean so and it was like to a certain segment it was kind of like a Hollywood like we like hip-hop you know it wasn't like a real ghetto thing or anything so right right so that lane 
I was real plugged in. And then we would go and try to make sure we touched everyone else, too, mm -hmm. as street promoters. So the DJing thing was like hand in hand, kept me in touch of what was going on. Mm. You know, I could play records I was promoting, seeing how they reacted and stuff. I mean, I, you know, I seen this old video the other day of me playing how I could just kill a man and I was street promoting that at this party <laughs> and people were going crazy and I was going, wow, you know, I'm, I'm double dipping, right? You know, right. I mean? but, but I mean, you know, um, at the same time too, I had a column in the source and I used to write about all these records in the source, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I was giving people exposure I was the first person ever to write about Cypress Hill, you know. So I, wow. I was just trying to do whatever I could to get involved in the industry and help promote at that time mm -hmm. because I was so like, you know, I was street promoting. I was writing for magazines. Mm -hmm. um, Herb, uh, BAM magazine was like a local music magazine that wow. I used to write for. I had a column in there called Urbam. Urbam. And, I, right, yeah. and I wrote for The Source. And, and then... And then, yeah, and doing this, pr promoting my own parties, DJing, street promoting for, like, you know, it was all, I was, L.A., hip-hop, this is a long time ago, so you got to understand that hip-hop was much smaller. This is in the era where it's just starting to kind of go mainstream. Right. So, um, it's a small community and everyone kind of knows each other. Mm. So this is what led to, like, artists like Everlast coming to me going, hey, I want you to be my manager and, and people like that. <laughs> You know, because and then when I found the far side, people it was in a hotel room at like three in the morning. We're all partying and stuff. Yeah, and the guy we got to talk about right. that at some point. Uh, yeah, continue. I'm sorry, but the guy, <laughs> the guy was like, "Oh, this guy gets people record deals." Actually, Razkaz brought the far side into the room, but the guy whose room it was, this gentleman, Lionel Brazil, said, "Oh, this guy gets people record deals." So, you know, kind of having that. Um, um, as, as I started to get people record deals, you know, then my reputation grew into that. Mm -hmm. But it all came from me being the guy that everyone knew from like either DJing, mm. throwing the party, promoting the records. All the DJs used to come to our house to get the vinyl. You remember, street promotion back then, a big part of it is giving records to DJs, you know, wow. something that doesn't matter anymore. But, right. you know, so we were, <laughs> you know, something that doesn't matter anymore, right? Yeah. But so that was something we were doing. We were passing out vinyl, you know. But, you know, I do think vinyl is a great um, tool for the right kind of independent artist. Yeah. Um, uh, I got one. I mean, I'm, I have yeah. one now. My first one was, uh, I've been in 20 years. I had my oh, first congrats. one yeah. uh, this, this year. But having it, for me, has its own feelings that, that attached to it. But I, I think I underestimated how much of my audience was like about time. Mm. We want to, and not even necessarily to play it because it's the highest quality of music and not just to play because they have a record player, but they just want to hang it up in the same way that you're looking up here. And I got shot a and Dilla and, sure, and, and sure. Purple rain. Uh, they just it's a collect want it. It's a collector's item. Yeah, it's a collector. There's value. It's in a that. support of you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, um, you know, vinyl is, is like you said, it past CDs and everything. And so, yeah, and it's a cool thing. I mean, I come from DJ background and everything. Mm -hmm. So like, I always think, I just saw how like peanut butter wolf, uh, at stone. So like a few Shout years back was him. killing the game with like these kind of like limited vinyl releases mm -hmm. of things, you know, cause if you, I, I, everything, everything is not right for everybody. You know, you might not make the kind of music that's right for a vinyl release. So you yeah. got to know your audience and and, sure. and know if that's you or not, too. You know, yeah, I, it just and I don't want to harp too much on it because I, I definitely want to dig more into your story. But yeah. the, it just amazes me how many artists are even afraid to see if that is if that is their um, if that can be a thing for them or if that's mm -hmm. part of their audience. They're, they're not even they're almost they're so crippled by fear. They won't even do the research. Mm to see if vinyl is appropriate for them. And um, you, know, you won't know until you make that investment, just like any any business, you make that investment, put it out there and see what it is. But I, I think a lot of folks will be surprised because of the, the novelty item it, it represents. I, I made this tweet today and I wanna share this with you and get your point of view. Yeah. It's amazing to me that the kids of the parents of 1975 that were buying pet rocks, <laughs> right. slinkies, right these artists are afraid to sell them compact disc or, 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 or a vinyl with your artwork right. on it. Right. And uh, I'm like, what are we afraid of? What are we really afraid well, of? You know, let me just not think there's enough of an audience for it. I don't know. You know, when um, my ex-wife was really talented DJ, uh, DJ Smiles Davis, and mm -hmm. when she first started DJing, 
I was retired from DJing and and she was getting started and it was the Serato was just kicking in, mm. you know. And she was like and she was working at Amoeba actually at the time. And so and I had some vinyl, but I had gotten rid of most of my stuff too. And so she was like, Oh, you know, I wanna get vinyl and everything. I was like, You're out of your mind. I was like, you know, <laughs> I think DJ Premier had already like, you know, started using Serato right. or something by like that time. I ran into him on a plane, he was like, Yeah, I'm using this shit. <laughs> you know, so I mean it was just like I told her you're tripping, you know what I mean? Like, you know, but she had this fascination for, and, 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 and everything for it. And, of course, I have this, you know, reverence for sure. it and everything. So, I mean, it's like also like when I started my book publishing company and I did this uh, book with Mike Miller. It's out of print right now, but it's called The um, History of West Coast Hip Hop. Man, it's something about having that physical product. Yes. And the same thing about like as a record company owner, which as an independent artist, if you press your own records, that's what you are, right? Uh, you know, or, or if you have a label, however you're involved, having that physical product of a record is pretty special yeah. uh especially just with hip hop and the history of hip hop and vinyl you know what i mean so uh yeah i think i think it can be cool at the same time like i said you know i'm not a I'm not a technophobe. I was telling you before about the. I, I saw this podcast about my man Austin. It's not my man, but this dude Austin that works for Atlantic Records uh, right. in the UK is from Spotify. Whatever was talking about old dudes just singing. I, back in the day, I did this and everything. Like, what have you done for me lately? You know, like you know. So yeah. I definitely, definitely happy to tell Tupac stories and all that. But man, also yeah, want to get to want to get to the practical, just... like because we got so much practical yeah. uh, things that we can tell independent artists about about. Um, uh, sync and everything, you know? right? And about, just, just about music in general, but definitely when we get to the sync thing, that's like, like my real expertise at the moment. You yeah, know? and I'm I'm just I'm just kind of moving it towards that direction. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. but just so the audience knows, I uh, I definitely want you to understand. Just I mean, we, we had one conversation thanks to the homie Thurs who connected us. Big thanks to Thurs. Big thanks to Thurs who connected us and having this conversation with him for the first time on the phone. There's just stories that are like. It never for one second felt like flexing. It didn't feel like you were like, oh, I'm trying to val You just were telling stories that were just your experience. And that's something that was like, you know what? There's so much history there. And we all know history is bound to repeat itself. This is why I'm always, I wouldn't call myself a historian, but mm. I, I definitely do my research because I understand the answers we're looking for are not just and I'm going to appear out of thin air. They're here. Someone's done it before or done a version of it before. And so um, I'm curious, you alluded to you were the guy that people were coming to at some point in time if they wanted to get a record deal. How did that happen? How did that come to be? Well, because I was so much in the mix, you know, I was promoting like this club called Water the Bush, which was like a legendary hip hop club where mm -hmm. we had like all kind of public enemy, De La Soul, X Clan, right. all kind of people perform. Um, and I was just involved in the mix. Um, artists started coming to me and saying, "We want you to be my manager. You know, help me get a record deal." Because that was that was the thing back then. You know, mm -hmm. you make a demo and you get a record deal. So <laughs> long before the internet, kids. <laughs> the demo. And, oh yeah, my yeah. gosh. And yeah. so um, first client was this woman, Vicky Calhoun. She sang backgrounds on Red Hot Chili Peppers and stuff. And okay. I got her a, a like what they called a demo deal, where the label put up some money to record some professional demos. And I got her a deal with Quincy Jones's label, wow. um, Quest Records. And um, um, then the next person was Everlast. He came to me and he, he had just done Cypress Hill was just bubbling and starting to like uh, come out as a group. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I need my own manager outside of that. Yeah. And um, I started shopping his demo, which had jump around on it, like un <laughs> unchanged from how it came out. And labels told me no and this and whatever. But, you know, I got him a deal. And so after that, like I said, I was still doing street promotion and I was like doing some management and um, I was at a hotel room at the at a convention the, in San Francisco. This this used to be this music convention called the Gavin Convention. It was a music industry journal trade. Mm -hmm. And it, we're partying like, you know, smoking, drinking like three in the morning. And, <laughs> and Razkaz brings these guys up to the room. He's like, they're a rap group. And the guy whose room it was said, this guy gets people record deals, pointing to me. Wow. And it was there was a guy that worked at Tommy Boy there. He was a marketing guy. Right. <laughs> there was a few other people in the room, but I had just gotten House of Pain the deal fairly recently, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said that, and they got in a little huddle, and they uh, they came out and started rapping your mama, and they were like jumping up and down on the beds and the thing, and wow. talking about your mama ate 82 burritos at Taco Bell. <laughs> and we were just crying. We're all faded. It's three right, in the morning. Right, you know? right, right. I remember the next day I was asking my homie uh, Malik Levy that I worked with a long time. I was like, were they that good, or were we just that faded? <laughs> 
And it's like, no, they, 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 no, were, they were that good. They, they for were sure. Good. For right, sure, right? right? <laughs> so after the far side, I kind of got my shit together because mm-hmm. I didn't really... Uh, uh, I had had the wrong attorney when I was working with House of Pain. He was right. like a big attorney. No disrespect to him, but I was too small on his ladder. He wasn't giving me any any juice. So mm. you got to get the right person for you. That's not like you got to network across. Like mm. I had the big music attorney, but because he didn't care about me when I was doing House of Pain, he didn't get the management contract mm. signed in time, and I ended up getting screwed pretty bad on the deal. Wow. No disrespect to Everlast. He got put in a really bad situation that he kind of had to do it. Really. Right, right. But, um, but with Farside, I had my shit more together. I found a young black attorney who was trying to come up. He recognized my talent, mm-hmm. and he said, okay, I'm going to help you. You know, because I wasn't paying any of these attorneys. Right. Like, they were getting their money out of the back end type of thing, you know. So he helped me get the far side signed up to a management contract. Um, I got them their deal. And then I found Coolio. And um, and then and then I met John Singleton. And so that kind of, that's what took me, you know, into, in, into the music supervision right. lane. So one question I got about that day after. You said you, you, yeah. you, you guys were, were kind of, like, intoxicated when you were right. listening to right. them at first with far side. What was it about? the far side that you saw oh. now with the with with the sober mind fresh day and everything you're oh what, what they were that you saw so up my alley i mean look we're from la like we're old school hip-hop cats if you were around this dialect so i grew up on new york hip-hop mm-hmm. like loved la hip-hop with dj egyptian lover all this kind of stuff right, and everything right. <laughs> you gotta understand but like nwa was not like everything to us like mm. they were great but we that was not everything that we were is what i was trying to say sure so we were much broader than that and la was pigeonholed as like this gangster and we loved cube of course we loved cube you mm. know what i mean but it's funny you know I, when i met john i was working for ice cube i was working for street knowledge records and i was managing the far side and he liked the far side cube liked the far side of course right. he did they were cool but it was just fresh it was different everyone's talking about how they you know they're they're macking your girl. They're talking about the girl passed me by. It was that right. reality thing. Like it always that always <laughs> vulnerability. To me. My whole career, Coolio had. I'm standing in the county line for free cheese. But I always was yeah. attracted to that more of like a reality thing. You know, mm-hmm. and they were just dope. Uh, they had they had bars. You know, sure. They, it was fun. It was funny. Yeah. It was it was it was um it was like a um you know it was of course I was at that time everyone was huge. Uh, native tongue fans, huge tribe De La mm-hmm. fans, they were like the LA version of that. The fun, yeah. the fun little brothers from LA of tribe and De La. Right. You know, right. the like jokester little brothers. So, like, those guys got it immediately. You know, we connected with Souls of Mischief when we all had demos out and they clicked immediately. So, it was just that new wave of kind of like under, underground hip hop, you mm-hmm. know, that, but want to have some commercial appeal to, you yeah. know, like, you know, uh, that that was the era. You know, underground hip-hop was still having commercial appeal at that time, so a much different era, you know. But not yeah. really, because you got Kendrick. Now, you know what I mean? It's, it's a good song's a good song. Those titles right. don't mean shit. You know what I mean? People, people get caught up in these titles. Oh, they're mainstream. They're underground. You know, you know. <laughs> the music is, is the music good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A song, right. a hit. Now, that doesn't change. A yeah. good song, a good hit. The, talk about what doesn't change. Right. You know. You so, think you, you think that, that applies now with especially the way that music is consumed and the way that music goes viral with the, I mean, even more than ever, more than ever. You think that there's a formula to a, you think the same thing that applied to a hit song before is what applies to now when BPMs are slower. And the word formula threw me a little. Okay. But because I think if it was that easy, we'd all just do it. You know what I mean? Every song Dr. Luke would make would be like, you know, whatever, but no, it's not that easy. There's a magic to it. You know what I mean? But at the same time, though, there are certain formulaic things or whatever. I don't know if mm. I messed that word up. Formulaic, yeah, you're yeah, good. Thank you, good. thank you. There, there are certain, <laughs> you know, things that, you know, um, and, and the thing, too, is, like, I, I saw this DJ, uh, was that, it was, I think, on your channel, we were talking about the DJ Premier thing, and they were talking about all the MF Doom songs that had no hooks or whatever. So, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. what is a hit or whatever, you know, is different. And, and also, too, like, not like his songs were so much hits, but it's just like he had an audi- he has an audience that's going to listen to his music over and over again. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know, he's not trying to appeal to the audience that's that's maybe more on the, like, formula hit type of things. But, sure. but, but there's things, there's basic things, I mean, like, you know chorus man the hook man like you know yeah. it's like it's all about like it's all about the chorus and the hook man and you, you know you got a lot of like underground artists and it's just like 
they kind of like they use their same voice in the hook which can work great but it can just get real repetitive like yeah, you just sure. you just overbarred me you just rapidly rapped me to death in your verses mm -hmm. and then i'm hear your same voice in the hook and you wonder why i'm bored and i'm listening to mainstream you know why i'm listening or, to drake or whatever right. like you know i mean it's just like underground artists got to make their music appealing or they can also go in a direction that's really like, I'm going to dive into this. Sure. I'm going to have super long intros. I'm going to make this kind of like really interesting artistic music. My visuals are going to tie into that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try to like have that audience that Joe Budden had after he uh, had his original run. You know, mm -hmm. where he had that like dedicated fan audience. Yeah, a cult, almost cult a cult following. following. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, and, and, and I asked that because there are artists, I feel like, lyricists of this age that are figuring out things that they can leverage for instance the kind of reach you can get on a TikTok. it's it's mm. it's a crazy the amount of people who you know talk down upon a culture or talk down upon lyricism not saying that you were you were doing that right now no, I, no. I understand exactly your point in that yeah. some people will rap quadrupled in entendres and then put the mic out and not understand why people can't <laughs> repeat it because it's like you're talking over me you're not talking to me and it's yeah right. i mean look <laughs> i love nas I, you know i'm not gonna i'm not here i'm but i'm yeah, not yeah. my personal taste is not the most like i'm a dj so mm -hmm. i'm looking at the beat first the mm. lyrics and they were secondary to me so to speak right and being someone who understands or hits or looks for hits for me like i say it's the chorus it's the hook that's everything mm -hmm. so people are so some people get can misconstrue what i say or take it take it however you want it to yeah, you know? yeah. i mean like you know what i'm saying whatever like and if if that's what you if, if you're gonna like really lyrical music i think is fine but also i feel like a lot of those artists need to let their songs breathe a little bit more mm -hmm. the lyric can be as impactful but do we need so many words does it have to be so wordy for example like right. like you know like i don't know like I haven't heard a lot of people bumping the Fushnikins or Das Effects or anything like, like, I mean, it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, where people are cramming all these words in or whatever, like, you know, type of thing or whatever, like, or that Eminem kind of style thing yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, I just feel like, you know, and I guess he gets plenty of streams. Right. And, and, and I guess there's plenty of like <laughs> imitators of him that also do really well and get sure. plenty of streams. So there's a lane for whatever I'm saying too, but I just, me personally, like, and, and, and as we get to sinking more or whatever mm -hmm. like that, to you know the kind of stuff that I'm looking for is just a little bit more. It could be great lyrically, but I right. just think it can't be too wordy. You know what no, I mean? And, too, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm with you on that. I, so we definitely gonna get to. I, want, I, I definitely want to get to the same conversation. So music producers, artists in general, if you want to get the information that you have been asking me for for so long about sync, I brought a few guests on. This is probably the guest to ask yeah. these questions that we're going to get to. Um, but I, I did want to, I had my own specific questions I wanted yeah, to sure. talk to you about and we got, we can obviously, we, it's not the last time. No, for sure. Um, but I did want to talk about, well, first before I get that, I wanted to offer this devil's advocate point of view. Cause this is when I've been kind of pushing as an artist, as someone who loves the lyricism. I understand there is a, a place in time for everything. There's a way that you can push one thing way too hard and then lose everybody except for the person that wrote it. And but I do wonder, especially in an era where it seems like the majority of the music that gets pushed in front of our faces is only one version of it, where mm. it's like the most limited amount mm. of words, mm. the most spaced out choruses. Mm. My question is, and, and this kind of goes back to um, there's a, definitely a lane for the other. Right. Well, well, well actually, this specifically yeah. talking about like a Basquiat who mm. in his era, he created whatever the highest level of art was for him. Uh, and obviously at some point for the people who were buyers of it, but he created this art because that was his goal was to be the best version of the artist he could be. My question is, are for we those, killing the Basquiat's of today? This is what I'm asking. Yeah. And I just kind of doing devil's advocate in that. I wonder how many people are even meant to be less wordy. If for instance, a black thought, a, a, a less wordy black thought kind of gives me a, a less black thought. Okay. So, so I wonder, I, and like I said, not not as a you know, like I could try to be argumentable, but I, no. I do wonder about sort of your perspective on that because you know you obviously love this art form, you've loved sure. it for longer than I've been alive. Um, but with that, I, I do wonder how much there are certain people trying to fit squares into circle pegs. I I think it's very well put what you said, and like I said, I mean, 
my personal opinions are kind of seeping out a little bit into this sure. a little bit more too than than maybe you know but like i said there's the lane for everything i mean you look mm -hmm. at J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar. I mean, look how successful these artists are. I mean, they're huge lyricists, right? Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? So, I mean, to say that you can't be a successful lyricist, I think is just like, is not true. Right, you know what right, I mean? Right. For sure. But um, the most of the underground rap that I hear when it's like presented to me, it doesn't give me that golden era feeling. Mm, what do you think is missing? If you just kind of like had to pick it out the air, what, what kind of things or elements of it do you think are missing? Because there's some people right now yeah. who I think believe that they're like an extension or they're part of that lineage. And in some ways they are, but sure. sonically they're not able to capture these things. I know some of it has to do with the hardware and mm. the warmth of the analog gear mm. for some things. But as a DJ, as someone who has mm. the ear that you have, what do you think it is that you're that you're hearing? Because I'm sure they even submit this for sync as well. Well, the the thing about that too is that mo what made the golden era so great was all the samples. So it's mm. hard for sync. But if you're doing that today and you're sampling, you know, and, and does it? Why does it not sound like still the old stuff or as good? Have the energy of that or whatever? I don't know. I think it's a few things. I think um, maybe some of it is like a little bit of like, like I said, the fun. Like not that all mm. old hip hop was fun, but you know, anything like that. But there was right. a certain energy to it. Uh, of a lot of things that was kind of like, uh, you know, everything's like so cool, tra trapped out, like this kind of thing now or whatever, but that it's kind of lost some of that. Or, or, or I'm sorry, we're talking about the artists that are doing right, 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 right. the goal there. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's hard to recapture that too. And also like if, if they're talking about some of the same topics and things that we were talking about back then, it's kind of like, oof. It has to be a fresh, it has to be like Kendrick. It has to be a fresh take on it. You know right. what I mean? And, it musical, it and to musically degree. too. Right. Because it's like, I love the golden era hip hop, but I don't listen to too much of it because sonically a lot of it doesn't hold up for mm. me. Like with, you know, with the newer stuff. You know what I mean? You listen to some of these records and they were great at the time or whatever. Or the, right. And there are some things that are of the time and there's some things that are classic. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... I don't know. I think that a lot of the newer artists that were inspired by that era, which I know there's tons of, and probably a lot of your listeners too. Yeah. I think they need to find inspiration from, you know, the Kendricks, the J. Coles, the the Denzel Curry's to some extent. So just the art, lyric artists that are doing it today. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also try to tap into what was great about back then, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit. You know, I definitely um, think that, yeah, you know, taking yourself too seriously and not having fun with it is is a bit of a a bit of a thing, you I, know. I did a story on um, a what is it? I forget the name of the term, but basically, there's an era of music that exists within the independent space and on the mainstream space, or the I'll just say the the traditional music industry space that is like disinterested music or like um, disassociated music is what it's called. This, this person wrote an article and they were saying that there's artists who l literally their entire delivery is about being disassociated from the topic at hand. They could be saying the wild, think about like Drake or the Ruler, for instance. Mm -hmm. They'll have, they'll say these like really crazy things, but they're not even surprised by it. They're not even showing you, right. which is why I love Far Side so much because right. in the moment they're showing you the Buster Rhymes. He's showing you in the right. moment, like, ooh ha, like he's, right. the passion is, 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 but it seems like a lot of things maybe that are um, reflections of the time. Maybe these are post-pandemic rappers. Maybe these are folks who are looking at, you know, a bleak economy. I, mean, I don't know what all the the things may be, but you're absolutely right. And then I wonder how many of these folks are just carbon copies of what they love from the golden era. And if they would even be accepted with open arms if they were doing the carbon copy back then when that mm. wasn't the cool thing. No. You know what Can't I mean? Bite. Can't no, bite. You no, can't do yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, like when Jay Electronica was coming out and putting out them records. I mean, there's all kind of artists that keep coming that'd be like, this is a new invention of, this is the same flavor of right. what was happening before. You know what I mean? Right. But a newer version of it, which is great because, I mean, hip hop evolves, people evolve, people's tastes evolve. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, like, I, I just go listen to that old stuff, more or less, if I want to. You got to... You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like when most Def and Talib came out, they brought something new to yeah. the, you know what I mean? Or whatever. So, right, mm -hmm. right. You got to bring a fresh energy, you know what I mean? To, mm -hmm. um, to it. And I, I think that, um, uh, some of, some of the artists that are in this space are doing kind of a formulatic 
of their thing. Right, right. And it's right. kind of tiring. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody so, wants you. I yeah. keep saying this on Twitter. Nobody wants your your impersonation or your rendition. I had to tell somebody this morning. Mm. I said, bro, the reason why you haven't experienced somebody wanting to buy your CD as if it is a piece of art to hang up in their house is because they don't want to buy a copy of an original. Mm. Same thing in art. Nobody, I mean, people do do that. Obviously, I got my grandmother had all kind of copies that she got sure. from, sure. from uh, you know, Marshalls and all these different things. But for those who are art enthusiasts, and I do, I do think people who buy vinyls nowadays, people who buy CDs, who want that 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 uh, that smell that they get from the book and all of these different things. And then also too, this it's funny as a teacher that was on my timeline that said that his elementary kids. CD, CD, you know, the CD, I'm sorry, the, uh, the CD players and the, uh, the, what was the tape player one? What was the, the one? cassette? Uh, mm-hmm. Not no. even the cassette, but the, what was the, oh my A-track? God. A-track? No, no, no. It was a CD with the headphone. Why am I, why is it escaping Walkman? me? Yeah, the Walkman. I'm tripping. Okay. Uh, he was saying that the Walkman is such a new experience. They're looking at this like, you hit the rewind here and you hit the fast forward. Wow. And you push these two together. It does this. So they're wanting to experience it almost the same way you read in this book called the tipping point point by Malcolm Gladwell, where he mm. said there were hipsters in, in New York, the art community who started wearing hush puppies when hush puppies was almost getting out of business. And they rejuvenated that entire market because of their curiosity. Mm-hmm. So the, the way my ex-wife wanted to mess with the vinyl. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, there's a fascination with the nostalgia of things. Sure. For sure, I think it's cool, you know. Right. So I, I definitely want to get into this sync conversation. I have mm. one last question about this, because uh, obviously a lot of this stuff will be covered in your documentary. Uh, but I got to hear you from you about this story of um, Montel Jordan and what you bringing him to Def Jam meant mm. to Def Jam at that point in time. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, it was a crazy time, right? Because, um, man, I owe so much to John Singleton, you know, all praise to John. I was, like I said, I, I had a job. I I was doing the street promotion thing, and a friend of mine said, hey, Ice Cube is looking to hire somebody to do street promotions and marketing for street knowledge records. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I mean, God, I was such an Ice Cube fan. What a dream to work for right. Ice Cube. So <laughs> I took that job. You know, my street promotion company wasn't really popping anyway. So it was perfect timing. And and like I said, I was managing the far side and everything like that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I'd gone over there. And, and, and that's when I met John. You know, that's when I met John Singleton. You know what I mean? So, um, wait, I got off track. You got to refurbish. The so, yeah, yeah. So basically we're talking about how you bringing... Uh, Montel Jordan. Oh, right. Okay, right. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So I was working for John, running his record label, um, music supervising Poetic Justice. We put out Indo Smoke. That was the first single from mm-hmm. uh, on, on New Deal Records, uh, Mr. Grimm, Indo Smoke, produced by Warren G. And um, John was a Kappa, and he had a Kappa friend, and he was like, hey, you got to hear this guy sing to John. Mm-hmm. And John was like, yeah, that's what I pay Paul for. You know, I, <laughs> I'm busy dating Tyra Banks or whatever. You know what I mean? I forgot he was yeah, dating Tyra. Oh, yeah, what yeah. A, John Singleton, man. Yeah, Rest yeah. in peace. Rest yeah. in peace, John. What a G. So he, um, Montel came to my office, sang for me. He didn't have this as I would do it or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And he played some beat he had made. It had like moogs in it. It was like fake Dre shit, you know, right. West Coast. <laughs> and he was singing about... Uh, driving up Crenshaw on it, and I was just like, "Oh, this you were hooked immediately." I hooked immediately. <laughs> Tall, good-looking cat, you know. I, right. At that time, Mary J. Blige and Jodeci was like killing it in New York with the whole uh, um, R&B hip hop thing. Mm-hmm. So I, like, this is our version. You know, this could be our version. You know. Yeah. So I was excited, and it's kind of funny the, 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 how the story worked though, because um, right after that, Def Jam. R.I.P. Chris Lighty, man, my homie Chris yeah. Lighty, uh, recognized Warren G. in the Indo Smoke video. And and all of a sudden, Russell Simmons is calling me, and they want to sign Warren G. Mm-hmm. And what ends up happening is I leave uh, John's label and go work for Def Jam. They give me my own label and, and, and all this stuff. So while this is happening, you know, John, uh, uh, and he got over it because he hired me to do Hustle and Flow and Snowfall and Four Brothers and all this shit, but he was mad at me at the time. And um, so... When I went over to Def Jam, I didn't want to pursue Montel mm-hmm. because I felt like it was dis- it would be like unloyal to John. Mm. You know what I mean? So I, I, I was at Def Jam, you know, we're doing Warren and everything like that. And then Montel's calling me. And I'm like, he's like, John won't even return my calls. I go, that sounds like John. 
uh, he, you know, the music thing was kind of like a, uh, you know, a pet project for sure, him. You know sure, what I mean? Sure. You know, so Not he, a center focus. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if Johnny was gonna call you back. Fuck it, man. You know. So um, <laughs> I told Def Jam about him, and they flew us out to New York, and uh, and Montel famously sang for Andre Hill. Andre Harrell and Russell when they're driving around in his Range Rover mm -hmm. and in his loft for Chris Rock and Russell and everything and and everybody was just blown every everybody was impressed and they just uh, they said yeah go ahead and sign him so that was the first signing to my label PMP under Def Jam right PMP had been the street promotion and the management company right uh, actually been party promotion management you know street promotion and then. Um, yeah, and then um, we put it out, and then and then it was Montel's idea to 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 do the Slick Rick thing, and uh, mm. you know, being a Def Jam record, it was it was easier to clear and everything, you know, which was great, and um, so it was totally his idea. But he had, he had his homeboy OJ Pierce, um, super nice guy, R and B producer, who also passed R I P, uh, produce it, and it was great. But it needed a little bottom, so I brought in Wino from Carson, uh, who off. had uh, <laughs> DJ lot, Wino. It's, a, it's yeah. a lot of Carson connections. Even yeah, it, yeah. I didn't realize even uh, Rascat, the Rascats from yeah, Carson exactly, as well. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> That's they're connected, and so mm -hmm. uh, he, I had Wino like do kind of a refix of it where yeah. he made the bass and drums, you know, more hip hop, right. stronger, right. and that's the version that came out, and wow. yeah, it just blew up, you know. And for for those who either were too young at that point in time, I was fairly young, but enough to understand when a song was playing everywhere, and especially in the area that I was in, because he shouted out, um, you know, Delamo, and right, that's where right. I was. I was playing Little League at the time. My right, pops right. used to play this song in his Toyota Camry, and it's funny because he's gonna laugh when I share this story with him. I was like, "Oh yeah, you know, you know, you know, uh, 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 DJ Paul, you, you, you know that that one we we sang about all the times we went to my Little League games." Yeah, I just had a conversation with him, and we talked about uh, music and whatnot. But that song was such a crazy, crazy push, and to be able to do that without the crutch of the internet. Mm. Well, you, uh, you know, you know, something real quick too. I'll just mm. interject. I don't know if you were done, but it was Def Jam's first ever number one pop, right? Number one pop hit, and their first ever R and B success because they that. really hadn't had everything they had done was rap and their and their R and B. They had like the the uh, Jam Master J had a group. I think it called the Three Flames or the something Flames. Mm -hmm. They had a couple R and B things that hadn't, hadn't really happened. So it was their first wow. pop number one hit, which is crazy. As big as the company as Def Jam is now, you know. And, and why was it that they needed that at that point? It was in time? it was actually Warren that saved Def Jam because yeah. uh, Montel was after Warren, and Warren's album went triple platinum. And w what happened was, when I met Def Jam um, and started talking to them, they were under um, distribution from Sony. That's where like the Beastie Boys and mm -hmm. Slick Rick and all those early Public Enemy albums had come out through. Right. But they were going through beef with Sony, and they were transitioning to Polygram, which would become Universal. In the in the middle of that, they didn't have any money coming in, and they had been, had a bunch of bricks. They had like you know, Death Row was killing it. They mm -hmm. hadn't had any of that West Coast stuff. They had had some really bad releases. This is before Jay Z, before mm -hmm. Murder Inc. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they were in a state where they weren't really popping yet. They weren't. They they were in a real dry spell for a long time. They didn't have any money coming in. And then Warren G's album went triple platinum, and it's just like all of a sudden, like you know, Polygram fronted them the money to uh, stay afloat because mm -hmm. they see all this money coming about coming in through this triple platinum album or whatever. So that's wow. why Russell says that uh, a Warren G saved Def Jam. Last question about the music industry because I yeah. get to sing. Last question I have: your point of view. What was your what was your expectation upon entering the music industry, and then what was I guess your your updated point of view after transitioning to doing more because it still changes every day no, right, no, right, i'm right, sure right, i'm right. sure because there's, there's enough stuff that happens in the news it's like this is not the hip-hop well, i fell in love with sometimes well, you know I, yeah well i was a i was a naive fan i didn't know anything about the industry i mean my mm -hmm. first job was an internship at arista records and then you know i was djing all, you know so I, I just grinded my way up from the bottom but i didn't know before I got into the industry, I really didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I didn't have any examples or anything. I was just very naive about it. Um, I was just like a head. Yeah, yeah. I just loved hip hop. I had a good ear. And so I kind of got, you know, like I said, I, got, I hit my head against the wall a bunch of times because I wasn't the shark business dude. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the like savvy business dude. Mm -hmm. I was the like, 
when PMP Street Promotion Company was like going strong and I, mm -hmm. you know, and all that stuff at one point, and I'm probably just starting to manage groups like, you know, we would just go every day at three and play basketball. You know, we're smoking blunts all day long. You right. know, Cypress Hills <laughs> hanging out at our house. What right. do things happen? You know what I mean? Like, we're hanging out with the Booyah tribe, Cypress Hills. I was like, hip. Did, and did you say, uh, what Julio song was that that you said was performed in your living room? Or, oh, Gangsta's or Paradise was recorded at my house in my living room. Yeah. They, what? The, the, <laughs> well, the producer was my manager. I mean, I mean, was my management client. The producer was my roommate and yeah. management client, Doug Rashid, and the singer was my wow. management client and Coolio came over to pick up a check he heard the beat and he just busted it out that's wild what a time what a time yeah. so let's make the full transition because this is where I want to make sure that you guys get your questions ready uh, we, Paul and I have been having a lot of conversations about ways that because he knows you know my my number one priority is always making sure that independent artists get to the practical information sure. and that they're all and that they're all in a position to take care of themselves as the small businesses that I view them as 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 you have have also uh kind of echoed those statements right. with that said uh talk a little bit about some of the things that you've been able to do because I is the, the resume is ridiculous but in terms of your role as a music supervisor in these different projects and then um, also in terms of just sync in general. Right. Sync is, I think, a necessary component to any like successful independent artist like um, game plan. Yeah, right? yeah. Like you got to have a sync strategy in, in today's world. You know, um, it can be really focused. Like there's a whole segment of independent producers, especially producers, mm -hmm. but also artists that are making their living from sync mm. entirely. And maybe they really had aspirations of being a, a, a more of a known independent artist before, sure. and maybe they're still pursuing that, or maybe they've just said, hey. And, <laughs> you know, and for the producers, maybe their goal was to place records on bigger artists or develop artists, and now maybe they're like, hey. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and you know, and they can go hand in hand. So, you know, but um, yeah, one thing I thought would be helpful is to kind of talk about the different strategies. Yeah, because right? right. well, yeah, talk about a different strategy, because you you gave me some game that I wasn't I wasn't aware of, because anybody who knows I got my horror stories when it comes to sync opportunities that I have been given and I had no idea they all fit in pretty much the same category and I hadn't really experienced the the totality mm. of sync and you kind of gave a name to it but I've had these situations where it was the headache of talking to someone who doesn't know how to properly uh, express what they want you to do musically having these very strict guidelines and strict deadlines giving you references that don't really make sense on paper or, or audibly, <laughs> but they want you to pull off these miracles and then pull them off in a crazy time period mm. and then do 40 and 50 edits. I'm not kidding you. 40 and 50 edits that could be literally derailed by having the wrong video editor in part in the, of the process that just messes the syncing of everything. Gives up. you the wrong Give version. Give you the wrong or version. Or yeah. And it just so many headaches that I didn't anticipate. And so, uh, a gentleman that I've talked to uh, about this before named Clint Music, he didn't give me that exact thing that you gave me, but he kind of alluded to it, that it's a whole nother world outside of it. What was the term that you gave those particular opportunities that I had that were sync? Yeah, you were in the commercial ad world, right? Okay. So, I mean, the commercial space, you know, is great because they pay a lot. Hmm. It sucks because often the experience is exactly what you said. Ad agencies are hired to help the music and it can go from I've seen it go from like so crazy like a commercial like yeah we're thinking about using Led Zeppelin how about some drill shit like <laughs> what <laughs> like you know like just from I'm not a miracle worker what just are we like doing? all over the I mean just you know and like you say the references are, are very hard to explain everything like that yeah this is a world that I don't deal with too much because okay. I found it frustrating and my producers and teams of people I work with found it just too frustrating, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And most of the people that work in that world work exclusively in that world. Mm -hmm. Now, aligned with that world, but a little different, more a little more civilized and a little bit better is kind of the promo trailer world as well. Okay. 
trailers have really specific music needs. They, if you watch trailers, they all use this stuff. Like they'll take Shoot an Aerosmith up. song, but they'll make so right, they'll make right, it like right. a trailer version or whatever. <laughs> they all have to have these huge or, things. Uh, or, Jordan Peele will do. Remember he did a I Got Five on it, but like a cinematic version of that. So right. it's very specific, and everything is to a to the edits to the cuts right right so. and, and then there's like the the melancholy like your heart felt like things for sure. trailers but there's a couple of very specific things promos for tv like ad stuff can be a good space that's kind of close to those but better because they don't really do all the edits mm -hmm. um they can tend to pay a little bit more but it's usually they're just taking like pre-existing works mm. or whatever i work in film and TV mostly, and we don't ask for no 40 edits. We don't usually ask for any edits. We just take... Where have you been my whole life? Yeah, yeah we just take the material that's pre-existing, and if it works, we place it. Yeah. Sometimes, depending, like like when I did a movie like Hustle & Flow or something where mm -hmm. they're going to be performing the music, yeah, there's a lot of edits then because, you know, we're writing music that sure. should be performed on camera and things like that. But typically, no, we're, we're finding pre-existing pieces of music and fitting them into scenes where they work well. Yeah. You know, so mostly for film and TV is usually done like that. Sometimes people write things. What happens a lot too is in my world is someone will fall in love with this Black Eyed Peas song, but then when they try to clear it, they're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, we're not paying that. So then they come right. to me and they go, hey, we've already cut the scene and everything to this mm -hmm. Black Eyed Peas song. And so then we'll make something that has the vibe of the Black Eyed Peas song, but mm -hmm. won't be so close that... Now, that's a work for hire that is yeah. done, that's closer to what your experience that you were talking about. But um, there aren't all the edits. It's not changing an original piece. It's creating an original piece for this exact thing. Makes sense. The good thing about it is whatever they're trying to clear, Eminem, Kanye, Black mm -hmm. Eyed Peas, that they can't afford... And it can be just some little baby group signed to Interscope that right. no one's ever heard of or whatever. But whatever it is they're trying to clear that you're knocking off a version of, making a new version of <laughs> something similar but not close enough to get sued, right. <laughs> it's probably going to be very placeable. Because yeah. there's probably going to be a lot of needs for that kind of a song. Because the needs tend to be somewhat similar. Over the music, film, TV needs, we do need everything. There's... Mm -hmm the scary ghetto scene where they need the scary music there's the uplifting you know yeah, emotional yeah. scene there's the you know every kind of particular kind of luxury car chase right and all these anywhere things, right? any kind of thing you can imagine typically like i mean i've been doing this for 30 years almost everything has come up you know what i mean like right. you know especially when you start doing period pieces or just different kinds of movies you know sure. that maybe aren't straight ahead urban or whatever but yeah I was going to say, your ear, man, your ear is phenomenal, especially when it comes to what I assume are some of the 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 duties or even the qualities of a great music supervisor. But for those who may or may not know, what are the responsibilities mm. of a music supervisor? That's a great question. A lot of film producers don't know. A mm. lot of people that should know do not know. And the job is also, it's, it's, it's a weird, very strange job I always tell people because there's the part that you just talked about, the mm -hmm. super creative part. Like, we need to find the perfect music to match this scene. Mm -hmm. And this is a part of it. We have to expose people. Like, when I worked on, on Insecure, I was turning Issa on to, like, Jungle Pussy and all these, like, crazy right. new artists. Because you were taking, like, abstract artists. And that that's when, when I heard songs, I'm like, I just, well, that's heard, a, you I gotta just saw give this promoted at You got to give her the credit <laughs> because she I, had I figured, the taste. Yeah. But... I did present her a lot of things she wasn't familiar with that she ended up using. Okay, so, you know. But you're only, as a music supervisor, you're only as good as the taste of the people who are making the final decisions. You're just usually you're presenting things, you right. know what I mean? So so there's that whole creative side, which is great and fun and wonderful, and that's what everybody wants to do. Everyone that says, oh, I want to be a music supervisor, they want to do that part. The other part sucks. The other part is the administrative part. Mm -hmm. You have to do the licensing. Every once in a while, I'm hired only to do the creative part, but it's very rarely. So imagine I'm clearing a song like I'm doing Old Dirty Bastards biopic right now. You know, these songs have samples. They have multi producers, mm -hmm. writers. So every all, four or five publishing companies, maybe, or at least two or three, all have percentages of the song. So, you know, you have to come up with, you know, a price that everyone agrees to. You have to get everyone to sign off on licenses. The administrative part is like, and even if it's an independent artist, you know, uh, uh, you know, everyone who's involved in the song that has any ownership has to sign off. That's its own unique set of problems because sure. you're dealing with people that don't necessarily understand 
what master rights are, who owns what publishing or whatever. You know what I mean? So that creates its own kind of situation. But, mm -hmm. but you know, so you have to deal with all the administrative part of getting the licenses signed so the music can be used. And that's... Man, that sounds like... Someone said it here. It sounds like a headache. <laughs> or can it be. is. <laughs> it always is, more or less. So so, so what keep... After, after all the experiences you have had and, and continue to have... What kind of keeps you, like your vitality so high and mm, all of this? Like, what mm, what keeps you excited about mm, going okay. to that next thing, mm. knowing that you have all this administrative work to do in addition to it? Right. Well, luckily, I hire interns and assistants who do the majority <laughs> Shout out of to that them. work for a player. Right. <laughs> but uh, but I have to oversee and I have to sure, deal with political sure. stuff now. Like, I might be on a show talking to the showrunner and the mm -hmm. and the execs neck the the network execs and the director and the editors and you know navigate all these kind of like things so you know and maybe but maybe I'm not as dealing with but I and then I have to step in on the administrative stuff and make sure they're doing it right mm -hmm. show them how to do it oversee it and so it can be a real, and when people act funny that's when it's really a headache you know mm -hmm. but um getting so I just did this show called two seasons of the show called The Hype it was a reality show on HBO Max and Offset was uh, the judge it was a streetwear okay. reality show Okay. and uh, it's cancelled but I just did two seasons of it and I put so many independent artists like got them their first placement on that show their budget was low mm -hmm. um, they had like really like intense music needs we put in like all these songs per yeah. episode they had really good music taste so they wanted like really good music all this eclectic different kind of stuff so the only way i could do it because there's all these little companies that are like little catalogs mm -hmm. i have one in fact all these companies that yeah, have I'm little like that. you know things where they <laughs> shop music to film and tv you know but most of those companies want a fairly high rate and i couldn't necessarily afford that i had mm -hmm. to find people that just were excited to get their music placed and were willing to take you know the money that we had to offer yeah. you know um so i gave so many independent artists their like first placements and independent producers because we use a lot of instrumentals to their first placements um you know and so that was a really rewarding thing and then you know people get to say oh my song is on hbo max show with so offset you know yeah. you know how big it is for the artist you know and so just you know um just helping young artists get placements, you know, is really rewarding for me. Um, just like getting, making the director really happy with some song that he never heard of that I sent it him. It works hand in hand. Yeah, you yeah. know, just being able to like, um, you know, when when I when I got hired to do that show, The Hype, it was with this production company called Scout. And I've done like nine shows with them. They were just so impressed by our work ethic. Um, both the creative people were really happy and then I made the producers happy with the workflow and all the administrative part where it's like equally important and yeah. it, you know, as your person said it's a headache so we had to handle that so you know just but making people happy like my clients happy especially on the creative side you know it's just really rewarding you know mm -hmm. what I mean and, mm -hmm. and then when it's like an artist and they're stoked you know I mean um, a couple years back, I got two chains a placement, you know, and it was really cool. You nice. know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I had just met them, and they invited me to the show, and I'm smoking big with two chains and everything. <laughs> you know, and I really like just, that. I just really to like add amongst chains. the collection of yeah, of, of, right. like, of this, just because you, you, I look at all the pictures, and I'm just like, there is no way one human being has yeah, been Forrest able Gump to thing. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm looking at, I'm looking at like you know people who are obviously in the front of the camera all the time, right? Who don't even have that kind of. Like, oh, yeah. you have been invited to so many different rooms for a reason. People need Paul in the room. Man, you know what's crazy? <laughs> it was kind of like a domino thing for me. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it was like early on, I started finding those groups. So the artists were like, you know, you know, like, oh, man, this dude get people deals, everything like that. And then it was like, you know, I worked for... I worked for Ice Cube, I worked for John Singleton, I worked for Russell Simmons, like all directly, closely learning from these guys. Yeah. And then like, you know, that kind of like, people later like, oh, he worked with Russell, he worked with Cube, he worked with, John. you know, like John was impressed I had worked with Cube when he hired me, you know what right, I mean? Right, right. And so it, it, it was a bit of a domino effect, you know? So, I mean, I think, um, but also constantly reinventing myself, like you mm. said, like that, that, that Forrest Gump thing in me, like, you know, just keep like, just keep going. And part of my, <laughs> I think I've been blessed in that, like, I have that personality, like I'm listening to new music. Like I'm, you know, like I'm, I'm excited by new music coming out now. I'm mm. like, I can still recognize what's good in new music. I'm not just like, 
can only like dissect a tribe called Quest album. Right. Or you know what I mean? So well, it's like that that like um skill set mm-hmm. or that kind of like which i i feel like i, I dj for like 15 20 years so sure i really helps. feel like i yeah i owe so <laughs> you know because when you're djing man like you know that like pressure of keeping people up on the dance floor is like hardcore man. whether it's at like some grimy little house party or a big ass club or function like you still have that pressure so like mm-hmm. knowing what people re- and i was trash like technically so i had to be 10 times better as a selector because mm-hmm. i was really just dropping shit in i was very unskilled technically as a dj that, that so, sounds like my first year as a rapper <laughs> that, sound, that I, sounds like I, I i knew at some point i had to figure out and it's funny because you when you're talking about farce so I, I met Fallet for the first time last year at the thought fest the happiness of pursuit fest mm. and i man I, I was one one of the people that i was like i just want to shake your hand I, you don't have to i don't have to introduce myself and he was like i know you I said, like, "What you? What you mean?" I was like, "Hopefully, this is a good thing." He said, like, "Watch your YouTube videos," and I'm just like, "It's, it's, it's." Even our conversation is the byproduct of some of that stuff as well. Uh, but so it just, man, it just, it's super dope. It kind of blows my mind in, in the moment thinking about it. But with that said, I want to ask you a two part question about sync specifically for the artists and Let's producers go. that are in here right now. Let's go. You have the golden ear. We know that you have the golden ear. Many people. I'm sure make those phone calls have made those phone calls because of your ear. What is it that you think the songs that do get picked versus the songs that don't get picked are Mm. the beats that get picked versus the beats that Mm. don't get picked? What do you think they typically have in common? Cause I'm sure this is something you have to teach your interns and all this stuff that you're passing along to them. But what do you feel like are some of the things that you notice? Well, there's, there's one thing. I mean, like sonic quality is super important. Like, like, you know, when we're replacing, you know, Drake records, like if it don't sound, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we're, you know, a Dr. Dre record. Or, like, so the sonic quality is important. Okay. It's very important, you know. Um, though I do use things all the time that aren't mastered, um, you know, sometimes. Really? Oh, yes, oh, every day. And, and, and even some of the things like the producers were like, it was a rough mix or whatever kind of stuff, but they're talented, probably, the guys that, that mm. said that. They're putting out clean stuff. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, you know, not it, to their liking, but it's still something they could, that you can They do could maybe with. cranked it a little harder, but it's still going to be like it's that back to back test. You, wow. if, if I play a, some any kind of major artist on Spotify and then I put your record on, as long as it just sounds like it fits there sonically, then we're fine. Sonically, yeah, yeah. right, right. So that that's that's just important. Then you know, like good advice is to study what's sinking, you know, because there are all kind of type of needs. So it is hard for me to go, oh, feel good, though there's not enough feel good for sure. You know what I mean? Like, mm. you know, but, you know, tension, you know, like we, you know, for these reality shows, for instrumentals, we used a lot of like hip hop trap records because they're so like tensiony and and the reality show, they're trying to like show tension between the situation. So they worked really good. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And it's a current sonic sound that mixes in well with like the songs or whatever maybe that we're using, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I think um, one thing like when we, for these TV shows that everything that I've been doing for a long time, that and this wasn't so much the same on film, but they might ask for it later if they're using it. Like we give them the instrumental version right when we give them the song. Mm-hmm. Because they might want to do their own edit because the vi- the dialogue might come in, like they might put the song in and the vocals might come in and then maybe dialogue comes in and so they want to just cut to the instrumental sure. of the song and the volume might go down or it might not or whatever. But, you know, so it's just like to that extent too, and I, I, back to the top of things that are too wordy or too crammed up mm-hmm. or it's sonically too noisy or whatever mm-hmm. like that are less likely to sink. Now, the noisy thing, you know, if it's like a horror movie and it's a scary thing, it can work or whatever. But typically, like things that kind of are a little more open because you might have dialogue coming in there, you know, things, you know, I mean, they're all range of emotions, you know. Yeah. They go from, you know, like I said, feel good, sad. Uh, hopeful, scared, uh, you know, uplifting, but there's definitely not a lo- not enough of kind of like feel good uplifting stuff. That's not that corny. Is? Like, why do you think that is? Like, you think you think you think that's a, a sign of where I guess the 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 um well the brightness in the samples made that easier. Like when you're uh, sampling great old classic records that are up feel good and everything like that, it's sure easy to make your record right. feel good. When people are making records from um. Looney, uh, 
Hmm. Looney Tunes? Looney uh, Tunes, okay, yeah, yeah. Are, are these kind of programs, stuff, right? Like which naturally are, major cores and all these different things going on there. Yeah. Everything's gone kind of trapped well, for a while, so dark or whatever. So, I mean, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, and I love The weekend, and but the pop artists with this kind of sensibility, too, have also kind of skewed the the sound very mm. uh, uh, that way. And then the, the other sound, or things that aren't that, maybe are kind of like pop up tempo things aren't really yeah it's is, is not that well, kind of warm feel good that that we're missing right, you know what i mean that's a right. more of like empowerment kind of like it just goes over a, the top. go to action you know well there's a there's <laughs> right. a, there's a place for those but i'm saying that kind of like that emo well i think the easiest way is because samples like what's missing kind of is emotional emotions and feel good and things like that and mm. the producers in back were cheating cuz they were taking all the live instrumentation off of jazz and soul records <laughs> and getting all of that but, all but, of that you know what i mean and now you don't yeah. you know it's a lot harder to write something that sounds as emotional as a John Coltrane or you know what i mean or whatever right. you're sampling you know what i mean but i, I make the argument though because there's so many royalty free samples that are mm. available now from people who are not obviously a John, not no. not obviously the, on the level of a Miles Davis or a John Coltrane but these are folks who can at least get it and you sonically should be able to, to freak it and you should be able to freak it because you're the producer, you're the producer in, in a way right too but right right what i was alluding to is could that be a sign of i guess just the general morale or the 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 sort of like uh trend hopping that a lot of producers or artists are doing where they're just giving you what they're being fed on the radio which is a lot of low frequency type of music a lot of music that doesn't sound feel good and if it's feel good it's probably on a whole nother station i wonder how much of that has to do with that because i say the same thing um when i listen to beats on monday we do this thing called critique my beats i get artists or producers that send this stuff that's like i understand writing from the perspective of being quote unquote suicidal for instance mm. but i think there's a certain level of like it becomes distasteful to where it's, it seems like you're just making this song because it's edgy mm. as opposed to this is your true experience and who's who's the judge but i can start to hear some of the the wording and i'm like it feels like i've heard this song already and it doesn't feel personalized to whatever your experience is because i don't even know who you are mm. enter any, anybody's name and it could be this i wonder if that's sort of the the a, a smaller issue that is causing that lack of feel good music to be there because i i for myself i i fell in love with hip-hop because of the feel good music yeah i think it's a combination of all those things yeah. you know the you know the, the artists that are writing the music looking at their future and and being scared and you know what i mean and things like that too you know and and yeah. and, and, the, and the music industry and you know the kind of whole you know but i i, I think that um and also too like because this is an issue with sync people that speak specialize in sync you know make a lot of this stuff and it's sometimes like you want to just like throw the cd out the window you know what i mean it's just so corny <laughs> right. you mean like so that's the thing and i think it's also hard too to be like like when you try to make something for something mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. always cringe you know so yeah. like trying to make something feel good can be very difficult especially if you're not in that space maybe you know what i mean or whatever mm -hmm. so you know there's there's like a fair amount of more like feel good R and B kind of like up tempo R and B alternative yeah. than there is hip hop or whatever too. But so much of this music is so like love lyric based that it also limits its. Um, see, like w w when I said earlier b b before camera, I was talking about rap lyrics. Mm -hmm. It's like most of the songs are relationship based, and so the lyrics are about relationships, and it's like it limits their use so much. And then the rap songs might be talking about rims, girls, cars, strippers, recycle, whatever. Recycle, they, recycle, This yeah. kind of, yeah, guns, this, whatever. So it's just like, there's so much of that material. I throw a rock and I hit one of those songs. So it's not <laughs> unique. So it's like, I, you know, I got 50 of those, so I don't need no more of those, right? You know, right. I, need, I need something like acoustic guitar, or you're doing this, or, or maybe EDM party, or just something different, like, you know, like I made this folder of like weird beats from producers I work with, okay. and, 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 and it was when I was doing that show, The Hype, because they were really into like alternative hip hop, and like EDM um, um, mixes, and different kind of, different kind of things, you know what I mean? Right. So I made this folder that had all these weird beats in it, and I sent it to all these artists, and everyone, and there was a couple like normal trap beats on there, and everyone made a song off the same trap beat, and I was just like, <laughs> Jesus. Like, I gave you all this weird, like, you know, Man, stuff. And to they like, still give it to you. They, they're just going to give it to you over a weirder beat, but, and, and I imagine for somebody who's seen so many, like I said, you've seen so many eras of this hip-hop culture, and, and you've seen the period of time where you were like, yeah, this is 
these are the kind of artists that I could present to a label and they're willing to take that chance on it because obviously because of your ear and because of the um the artist just being something that feels fresh and new it just seems like nowadays that that business model has changed oh. dramatically well, right well, so where well, you don't even take a chance on some of these well, artists as long as there's a kendrick and a j cole that exists they're like we have enough already well you, you know what <laughs> well there was a there's a guy in the music industry named Mike Karen. You know he was he was doing street promotion stuff for me when he was in high school. He was working for me, but right. you know, he's a pretty powerful guy right now. But he's the guy that we have to blame to some extent. I say, <laughs> I, say, I say that jokingly, no right. no disrespect to Mike or whatever. Uh, but he started the money ball thing. Like he's the one that started analyzing stats. Oh, what's the analytics? I remember he's that movie. Guy, yeah. He's really the guy that started analyzing stats. So like you know. Um, and started signing people off of that. Mm -hmm. And once the industry kind of like leaned into that, it was like talents out the window, you know, like who cares? But mm -hmm. you know, I, there's also something, I think I might've got it from one of your videos, I'm not sure, but it was talking about the crazy amount of artists that major labels have signed right now. And oh yeah, that, that, so, so and, and we don't hear them. I kind of get emails about them because I'm a music supervisor, but I right. ignore them. But they're telling me about all these new artists that the major labels have or whatever, you know. And like, and yeah. sometimes go, God, there are a lot of these, and they might, you know, like, and there's just so many that you don't know about. But um, I feel like most of these did have some kind of like regional TikTok or some kind of like analytics sure. that, that got them signed to begin with. Most of them aren't getting signed off talent That's or anything. Crazy. Well, you know, and not saying that they weren't talented to get that break, but yeah. it's not like you just don't take a kid with a great voice into a exec's office that much anymore, and they sign them from talent, you know, right. which is okay. I mean, you know, like you show and prove. Like, you know, it's just you can't push a rock uphill. It's like this is the way the industry is now. So yeah. if you're that great, then you just gotta like get some numbers on it. You know what I mean? So to give context on what what Paul was referring to, um, we had a conversation uh, with a gentleman named Juju McLean, who is part of United Masters A right. and R for United Masters. And what what got us to this conversation was a really controversial statement he made about rappers in their thirties and how they you know there's no space for them. And you right. can obviously chime in on that, but. Uh, he came on for an interview and very, I don't agree. Yeah, go you ahead. don't agree. Okay, no, good. Yeah, yeah. We'll have the conversation. Yeah, yeah. But in the midst of us having the conversation about just the, the industry as it is today, he was like, he threw out a number very casually. Like, yeah, you know, Atlantic record has about 400 hip hop acts signed right now. And I'm like, excuse me. I said, I said, how many? He said 400. Like as if you didn't know that type of thing, but he's like only about 10% of them will actually pop. And that's when I made the connection they are hedging their bets on these artists like their real estate. Yeah, They're just buying up a bunch of TikTok real estate. You yeah. went viral, cool, we'll sign you this, we'll sign you this. And they're just, just, just waging, they're just looking at this and saying, I have a better chance of one of my investments popping off if I buy up all this property. And it's just an insane way to think about it when it's obviously an art form that a lot of us care so much about. Right. Not that we want to change places. I don't, I don't want to change places with them, but right. it's just unfortunate when you see that because it's like, independent artists if you're on the fence there's 400 of them signed right now which means that i don't want to call them all carbon copies but i'm pretty sure a good majority of them have figured out how to ride the wave of something that has resonated with people in general you got 400 people who are doing better impersonations than you <laughs> right. at least according to them add yours on top of that you have to really weigh what's going on but what is your viewpoint about rappers in their 30s and um, well, hip hop in the oh, way that it kind of treats older age uh, and, and how old is Russ? Can we Google that real quick? I got you. Because do that. because whatever if he's, I'm assuming he's in his 30s, and he's got to be one of the most successful rappers in the game right now. Like he's making way more money than probably 31. Yes, that's 31. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, and he doesn't look like he's going anywhere anywhere soon. You know what I mean? Either like he's, you mm. know what I mean? So no, I think that's a, I think that's a ridiculous way that the major labels are looking at it. I, I, I think that it is a young man's sport. And I think that if you are an older artist, you're going to have to be realistic and you're going to have to approach things potentially different. But, you know, also to a lot of these, look, I mean, all these guys are old, man, that are out right now. I mean, doing well, though, mind right, you, on these stadium saying, exactly. tours. Yeah, right. I mean, tours, all yeah. the artists that are right now are not mostly young, you know what I mean? They're like, even the guys that we look at as young, like yeah. Uzi, is, get, you know, they've had a few years in the game now. They're not as young as they were or whatever. So, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I think anything is possible. I think if you're an older artist, you know, authentic, authenticity is usually what I think 
helps most artists kind of break through. Mm. So you got to kind of be true to what you are. If you're trying to appeal to TikTok trends and none of your friends are on TikTok. <laughs> you might be, right. might be aiming in the wrong direction. Huh? Right. You know, it could be <laughs> tough. But at the same time, you you couldn't be an independent artist and come right out right now and ignore TikTok. Would be right. stupid, I think. You know, sure. I mean, you know. I mean, I've seen a whole bunch of things about country music on TikTok. So it's not just, yeah. and some of those artists aren't young. You know what I mean? Though there is a wave of all these young country artists, you know, are coming out. Yeah. But, but um, no, I mean, I, I think, um, man, there's there's different paths. You know what sure. I mean? There's, like we said, there's different paths. You know, like like I was saying for the sync thing. You know, telling you off camera. You know, right. there's we a have whole... some sync questions in here for you too as well. Okay. Uh huh. We but can no, you can no, continue. You continue. Okay. Well, you... there's a whole yeah. bunch of people right now that have figured out they can make a living from their music in the sync space. Mm. And that is the primary, if not 100% way, they are generating income from their music. Yeah. Especially a lot of producers have turned into this. Um, yeah. And, you know, they might have other things that are, in, you know, like they put out the music that syncs, mm -hmm. and then when it gets on a show, it gets a whole bunch more streams than normal. So yeah. their streaming income went up from, you know, Budweiser money to you know uh, Jose Cuervo money or whatever <laughs> you know what I mean like so definitely. but their real money's coming in from probably the sync advance fees mm -hmm. and uh, um, money generated from from sync in general yeah th there's a and, and huh sorry and then there's the other side right of independent artists whose career is being significantly impacted by syncs that they're getting mm -hmm. that's helping them grow as an independent artist either just out of luck. Or because they have positioned themselves in part to help get those things. Mm, that's huge. That, that's huge. And I think you even alluded to when we were talking off camera. Um, there's even a flip side of that where there's some some artists or producers who have to feel like they need to change their name because there's certain opportunities that they get that may be outside of their brand's center focus. And so they feel like they need to kind of go go in that route as well. It's kind of like two reasons we use aliases, right? Yeah. Like there might be a group, and it's it's they they can do something that's a little different than what they're doing currently artistically, mm -hmm. that could be very syncable, but it doesn't maybe really fit in with the aesthetic that mm -hmm. they're on. So they don't they don't want it to show up on their Spotify. You know, they don't want right. it to mix in with their <laughs> program. You know, they're doing dark gospel trap. You know, right. R and B. And uh, but they got th they can do this country EDM stuff or whatever you know. Right. I'm just throwing out crazy genres, but but you know so they use an alias. They make the sync money, but it doesn't affect their main brand, and it doesn't have to affect the business anyway. They can still have you know the same business. Also, many producers that I work with have tons of aliases for their projects, mm -hmm. where maybe it's like um, you know maybe it's a. Pro producer driven project and there's not really an artist on it mm -hmm. so they give it different names yeah. so it so their projects so it doesn't seem like they got 500 things by this one group they got 100 by this and another and, and helps divide it up like oh explorers is my indie rock group you know um beyond is my edm group mm -hmm. you know um you know yeah. um yeah, definitely, definitely. We got a few questions here that are starting Let's to pile roll. in. Uh, one is from Miss Lyrical Penny. She says, "What would be the typical format for sync?" It's a really general question, I'm sure, but uh, what will I guess be the general? I know every project is probably case by case, but yeah, I'm not quite sure I understand her question. Mm -hmm. um, can she? Yeah, if you're still here, Miss Lyrical yeah, Penny, yeah. elaborate a little, little bit yeah. more. We'll definitely come back to it because I would say, I mean. Every situation is different, you know, as far as, like I said, when I submit the songs, I'm asking for MP3s. I'm not asking for waves, if you met that format. Yeah. Um, when we know that something is definitely placed, often we'll replace it with a wave. At that point, we ask for the wave. Um, mm. As far as the format of the music, it can be anything. You know, we use instrumental music. We use uh, super vibed out things that don't have hooks. We use things that have uh sparse vocals uh uh we use full-on songs that are complete you know chorus verse hook or whatever you mm. know so um oh she said bpm range oh really depends you know i mean i think um for that i would say study what's placing study the kind of music that you want to do on the kind of film or tv shows or ads That's or great. things that you want to do see what's w working there and and take inspiration from that. 
you know, it's yeah. a bit all over the place because um, the desires and needs are so different. And like like we were saying earlier, there's there's ad sync, there's video games, there's promo trailers, there's TV shows, there's movies. Mm-hmm. Some all they all share some things, but each niche has some particular things, like the horror ad things that that Curtis went through with all the changes. <laughs> you know, the trailers. Notice ten- the past tense that right. Curtis went through. Right, right. <laughs> yep. But I, I, but I am. I, you got me. It, it's always at times that I'm like, give it one more well, shot. Well, no, this is the thing. Okay, <laughs> any independent artist who's got music on hard drives. Or SoundCloud, or YouTube, right? Or the major streaming services, and is not trying to pitch this music for sync, assuming it's syncable. Mm-hmm. That means it's sample free. That means there's no publishing infringements. Sure. Which we can talk about later if people want to understand more what that is. That also means there's no YouTube beats that you just license so you could put it on Spotify or right. like that. <laughs> so it has to be syncable. But if you have this music and you're not trying to get it synced, you're leaving money on the table. Because if the music mm-hmm. is of a sonic quality and a and a and a quality quality mm-hmm. where it's good enough, um, then you know because we sync things all the time that you know never got played on the radio mm-hmm. that maybe sometimes aren't even that great. But you know they're yeah. they're 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 sonically up to par probably. And creatively, they're at least, you know, I mean, I have a job because people, there's so much generic music out there that, Mm -hmm. you know, for these shows and TV shows, people have, the editors have access to all these libraries and they have thousands of these generic songs, but it's like, it's kind of generic. So people want something more creative, so they hire me and, you know. But uh, to further answer your question, it sounds like you're a producer. Asking about BPMs, I'm assuming. Well, you said lyricist was in her name, huh? No, no, but she she uh, is a producer. Uh, she, it's uh, it's Miss Lyrical Penny, but she she, she does both. Is a producer. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I would say you want to have all the different BPM ranges covered mm-hmm. in your catalog of music you're syncing. Mm-hmm. You want to have your feel good. You want to have your dark and dangerous when they're walking down the alley or when they're in the hood yeah. and a song comes do, out the car. Do what, you suggest that they start to create? Uh, two Max gave me this 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 bar before. Mm. Do you suggest that they create folders that already have emotions or even like car chase scenes mm. attached to them? He gave me that. He was like, that's how he was able to get a lot of his first sync opportunities was creating these uh, numerous folders that when they gave him the call, he was like, this is going to folder. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We we place our stuff by genre, but also by emotion, mm. and then sometimes like. You'll say like action, yeah. I tend to do that more for instrumentals, mm. but it can work just as well for songs. For songs, we would more say like up tempo, feel good. So, like I said, we tend to do them by like emotions, like you know, and genres, or it'll be a mix. It might be like hip hop up tempos or whatever. Yeah. You know, I try to not get too crazy, like hip hop up tempos on a Tuesday, like where you're like just defining things too much. But typically, yeah, you want to really do a lot of that, especially for like people that haven't started that at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, take their catalog and 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 say like, okay, these are my sad emotional songs because there's needs for those, right? Or, Here's my up tempo club party song. You probably already within your library have some of these things. Yeah, and then if you get focused on seeing where the gaps are and 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 you know look i i have to do this and i really wish they would pay me i do have a link that people can use where i get like free credit or whatever but there's this platform called disco i was telling you about it and if you want to make sync your primary way of like making a living how do you spell that by the way disco dot ac uh so disco like you know disco and it's a music management you know, you know, program, and, and, and all the music supervisors and all the people in sync use it. So you're a step ahead if you're submitting your music on it. And it's a great and affordable platform for storing music for producers, artists, or anyone like that. Mm. Before we were using Dropbox, like I think you said earlier. Yeah. So <laughs> that was my favorite. I use so Dropbox. I still use that now. Yeah. <laughs> I still kept my Dropbox because I have so much video content on there and stuff, and I need it for that. But for all my music stuff, I'm on Disco because it's just gotcha. such a great platform made for music. You right. know what I mean? Right. And then, um, and like, for example, if you want to send me something, I can just... 
uh, I can give you an upload link, and you can upload it right to my disco. Oh, I'm signing up. I, I already started the process right. when you gave me that call last time, but mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I was, I was, I wasn't gonna plug my stuff, but I definitely gotta let you hear this project that I just no, completed. Man, I think, no, no, yeah, come I think on, you man. Really enjoy that. We gotta get this bus driver off the bus too, man. But, but, yeah, shout um, out to my guy Aaron Barber, man. I, uh, but this is the website for those who want to go ahead and check it out. Uh, I'm sorry. Go, continue. Yeah. No, I mean it's just it's a great it's a great. I I don't have any affiliation to it. You know what I mean. I am on a music supervisor program, so I have a cheap uh, thing or whatever, and I do have a link. Like I said, if you want to like refer for me, which gives me more free time or something like that. But <laughs> but no big deal. But but it's just such a good program that I I have to recommend it. Like if you're mm-hmm. like not too serious about saying you know you don't you know but if you're really serious about it i think it's like 15 bucks a month or something for like a thousand songs yeah it's gonna it's gonna be worth it no, uh, you, um, you, you messed me up with that you know you may just all that music on your hard drive you might be just sitting on money when you said that i was oh, like that's man. one of the moments it's yeah. one of those moments i'm here and i'm like oh god you i had yeah. a i made a meme <laughs> that i used to send out and i actually have it in spanish too and it has a picture of a little hard drive and it yeah. says your music isn't making you any money here. And I I send it out to people, right? (laughs) And you know, and that could go for SoundCloud or YouTube pages where, you know, or Spotify where where, where you're not really, if it's not generating any streaming income, which is most people's music, right? Right. So, you know, like um, organizing it and shopping it for sync, you know, there's things that you're gonna wanna do. Uh, I'm sorry, somebody typed in. Thomas Davis said, my folders, some of the sync folders, he said there would be no good baby daddy, <laughs> baby mama drama, and here comes twelve. <laughs> Those are your folders, man. Uh, well, well, if that helps you organize, let it let it be. But that's hilarious. It's a start. <laughs> it's In a fact, start. and that show and that shows you that you need to expand your topics if you yeah. if you want to get sinks. Now, like I, I got, said, I got all this baby mama drama right, right. inside my catalog. If you need that, and also check out <laughs> check your life, bro. No, no, I'm 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 gonna find one to talk. But um, no, I mean um. The more diverse of material you have, mm-hmm. the more different kind of syncs you can be appropriate for and the more you'll get. So having a bigger right. catalog and like your man Tumek said, having it separated so when people ask for it, you can easily send it and you're not digging for it. <sighs> And you know, having that instrumental, I've, lo- I've lost, I've lost. That's why it. you got to get them in yeah. that in the cloud on disco and off those hard drives because you people hard drives break and you lose the instrumental to this or you don't have it. And, oh, I never exported, I never mixed that out of that session, and then you know whatever. And like, oh man, believe me, I I, I use people's old music all the time, and I'm like, oh, and they asked for the instrumental, I'm like I don't have it, and like yeah. so I've heard that so <laughs> many times, you know. So yeah, if one thing I could tell people interested in signal is is export an instrumental that's a good mix okay have it together name it instead of whatever beat name it had before the name of the song but instrumental version the labeling oh my god i could do an hour <laughs> on the labeling. the more creative people are the worse they do these kind of things typically like you know really hey, i tell you the late the libraries that have all their generic music you want to know how well labeled their shit is man like when you when see you say some, well labeled what is what is what is that what does that what does that specifically look like for? Okay, there's no O O one uh, in front of the song number. There's no okay. <laughs> the artist name is not in the song title name with the song. Right. The song title name is there. The artist name is there. Mm-hmm. In the metadata, I want the publishing and writing splits, and I definitely mm-hmm. need your contact information. You sure don't want to be sending MP3s out without your contact information. Yeah, That's a big no brainer. So and 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 this, these are the things that will help people make feel like maybe you understand sync and maybe they can take a chance on working with you, if you have all of your contact publishing writer splits, master splits, and contact information in the notes section. You know what I mean like these are the things when I send out music when I'm on the catalog side like you know, all of that stuff is is already done and mm. if you see it's done then people trust and some of these TV sh- shows move so fast they'll. St- crank out a license from the material from that information that you provided in that mp3 wow so that could actually and get speed it up the payment process by you having the, that in there right and get it out to you and that's y- good yeah sometimes we pay people really fast on these shows because we need to clear them really quick mm-hmm. the bigger the company the slower it can be you know sometimes we rush people a whole lot and then the mm-hmm. payment's really slow it can happen oh that, yeah. that's that was another part of it too yeah. that, that was that was a part for me where i was like all of this rushing all of these drafts and i mean it's not like they're calling at a specific window of time. 
I might get a call at 10 p.m. while they're all working remotely. Yeah. And they're like, hey, Curtis, so God we got some somebody's work. in England. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Hey, Curtis, I, I know you're probably asleep at 3 in the morning, but uh, we got an update about what you just sent through, and unfortunately, none of it's going to work. So what we need you to do is spritz it up a little bit, make it a little bit more gangster. We need, like, B.O.B., and, you know, it meets. These are real things that people, I, I've shared this story a million times, right. but folks who don't know what they actually want because they can't translate it as it sounds in their head, not even know what it sounds like in their head. You said Led Zeppelin and Drill, and I'm just right. like, somebody right now has sent that out as, as a the, brief, as yeah. a brief, yeah, for sure. So here's another question from Ben Sen. He said, it, it might be a dumb, no, you know, dumb questions, man. You had to ask it. Uh, he says, might be a dumb question, but would there be publishing infringe, infringement if you self publish the track? No. When, when I was talking about publishing infringement is when um, you take uh, that, that Fuji's hook and you change the words, but you sing it in the, uh, in the uh, in the same vocal melody as the hook, so we all know you're talking about. We all recognize it's that Fuji song, mm -hmm. you know. Or when you replay something, but you don't actually sample the record. Mm -hmm. These are all publishing infringements. No, mm -hmm. no. Self publishing is ideal. I mean, that's if you're independent trying to get syncs, you have to be self publisher, or you have to be with someone who is shopping your syncs. Because if we have to go through a publishing company. We, then we're not dealing with you because there's, <laughs> there's two levels. There's the, I have to deal with all the publishing companies and there's yeah. the independent people that we're dealing with because it's like what we call a one stop. Mm -hmm. Hopefully maybe your homeboy produced it and you guys are all friends. And you're going to work it out, but you know what I mean? But it's kind of a one stop situation mm -hmm. and everything is self published and independent, fully independent, hundred percent independent and original. So is there, and this is my particular question. Yeah. Is there any conflict of interest when a producer is, making a beat and they include for instance splice sounds uh sounds from splice.com which you know on the contract it says royalty free uh, i've had sync opportunities that had like uh a vocal that was royalty free in it have you ever have you seen those cause any issues as of late i have really some of the really corporate companies have have, have um told us not to use records with splice in them wow yeah so is that specifically like, yeah, was specifically with splice yeah yeah yeah, and royalty for libraries in general. Because mm -hmm. um, it's such a big part of production right now where it's like you're I, I going would say to be, find a I sound would say there. be careful with it. Yeah, I would say be careful with it. Um, if you're submitting it for sync, like double check. Like if it's if it's not a splice or something like that, you know, be oof, very leery. If it's a big name like a splice or whatever, you know, it should be mm -hmm. okay. But if it's just too, if the whole song is like too hinged on it, mm. then, then so that, what, what about like small additions? Is like for instance, like I'll use uh, a short saxophone riff and echo it out for like the end of a bar. Would that be something where it's like it's it's a sprinkle on the that top? That sounds fine. That yeah. sounds fine. I think um, check with whoever you're submitting the music to. You know, like I would use Splice for some projects, but when they told me not to use it, then I made sure I didn't use, didn't it. use it. You know yeah. what I mean? So I think that was a little over paranoid, but um, these things are constantly evolving and changing, and that's why Man. you're good to have good need good people on your team to help you. You know, if you can build a team, especially in the sync part, you know, because these things do move around a lot. Things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. What is the proper way to approach a company for syncing opportunities as far as when you send an email or inquiry or how would you say mm. the best medium is for mm. connecting? Well, one thing I would, uh, I wouldn't just send MP3s as attachments in emails. That's not really, that's kind of like bad etiquette. I would, if, if you had a way to send a link like you know like before you know I, I remember the day we used to use soundcloud like i don't mm -hmm. know if you know we before disco and all that stuff and you know kind of like soundcloud was a little better than dropbox because you right. can make playlists or whatever yeah, right? yeah, a private playlist so, right, right right exactly so you know. if you have a website or something like soundcloud or something where you can send a link mm -hmm. to your music or your spotify even or youtube even that's okay but don't send mp3s um, I would be very careful to definitely not say anything with like samples or YouTube beats or anything that they couldn't use. Mm -hmm. um, why YouTube? Because you said that a few times. Why YouTube beats in particular? Well, because most of those licenses do not um, 
clear for 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 license they're only clear for you to use it to to post it on the streamers oh. and most of those guys don't they're not friendly to the license like they don't understand that this is like an independent thing mm. like so they you know they, they they don't necessarily um wouldn't be easy to deal with as far as clearing it. You know, wow. like you have to understand your leverage in the situation as an independent artist when you're licensing stuff. Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes to your question too a little bit. I'll come back to it a little bit more. But, but you know, um, yeah, I, I would just say, you know, to say that, you know, you have great music for sync, you know, you're looking for opportunities, everything's 100% original mm -hmm. and, um, uh, you know, sample free, everything is, um, you know, mention that. Um, I, you would probably say one stop, you know, to contain. And if you're an artist and you're that, and you and you're using production from a friend who's who's with it, that's kind of what that means. You sure. know what I mean? Like I said, that doesn't mean that you licensed it from YouTube because you probably don't have the license to then that I mean, license doesn't if they even allow have one you, available. <laughs> right, right, right. To do that, right? I don't think they most of those offer those kind no, of licenses. They, they're using right. standard no, right. stuff that Beat Stars or right, whatever pro right. provides. Yeah. Exactly, right. So because they want to be able to come back and renegotiate it in the way that a publishing company does, mm -hmm. you know, like when we go to major publishers, like you know, there's no set price. You know, they're kind of like, oh, what's your budget? You know, there's this whole hemming and hawing <laughs> that we do. Well, oh, and that brings me to one point I definitely wanted Please to make. Share. Please that share. we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. As an independent artist, oftentimes if someone presents you with a contract, whether that's a record label, a production deal, services for marketing, services for video production, any of these kind of things, mm -hmm. It might be negotiation involved. It might be very wise for you to try to negotiate that deal. Mm -hmm. If you're presented with a music license, that is not the situation. Do not think you have the leverage to negotiate. Mm. The licenses are standard. Now, if you're talking to a company that's going to represent your stuff and put it out, they probably have their set uh, thing. 50% of an advance is a fairly standard um is a pretty industry standard with that. Some people are even more aggressive where they take percentages of publishing and things like that. You know what I mean? So, mm. but um, that could possibly be negotiated, but probably not because the company probably has, you know, in place what they do. Mm -hmm. If they're a smaller company, certainly might be negotiable. But, um, but when you're getting an actual license from a music supervisor or from a production company or whatever, mm -hmm. it's probably a, a fee that's probably the same as other people, at least in your class range, are getting. Right. It's probably what we call MFN, meaning most favored nations, meaning they can't pay anyone more than you. Everyone gets the same. Mm -hmm. um, someone could get paid less, but you know, but 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 it's if you sign an MFN deal, that means you can't get, no one can get paid more than you unless they're like, you know, the weekend and you're, you know, an artist with a thousand streams, right. you know. Um, so the deal is usually is what it is. So understand your leverage in that position. And license fees can be very small too, but it's a license. Mm -hmm. You own the song completely. It takes no yeah. rights away from you. The only rights it grants is that we have the right to use your music in that film or TV show, mm -hmm. and then typically we could also use it in promos and ads if we use the song in the from the scene. If we're playing the scene that your song plays, we can put that in the ad too. Mm -hmm. We can't cut the show, the we can't cut the trailer to your song. Right, <laughs> it's not how this works. Right, <laughs> but those are the only rights we have. We don't right. own anything. We can't put it on Spotify. We can't, you know what I mean? So you can re-license it to five other movies or TV shows. It's mm -hmm. not exclusive, you know? So understand that the licenses, the fees can be small um, and you probably have no room to negotiate that. That's so huge. be very careful about how you handle those relationships because it's, there's n no part of the music industry that's more relationship based than the sync thing. There's mm. a very small amount of people that control the corridor to the people that that get the syncs. Uh, every single opportunity that I've had, even with the the ad side of things, commercial side of things, have been because of relationships that I had. We talked about a mutual friend of ours in MERS uh, aligning an opportunity. There was another gentleman that he happened to work for an ad company and they asked him do you have any connections to anybody in music he used to be a former artist who happened to know me and he uh vouched for me to come in there i have not had any opportunities even us talking right now about the potential 
of uh, working with one another, like that's because of Thurs and me knowing him and, and, and being able to have that conversation that makes sense. But um, well, let, for, let, me, for, let me give you this perspective. Right? Sure, you're a music supervisor. Okay. okay. Um, every independent artist in the world wants to get their music. Let's say you're doing a big show, God forbid, right. in your show. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So it's overwhelming, man. You got to just shut people down, you know? And then also, mm. too, how do I know what you gave me wasn't a YouTube beat? How do I know there's not a sample you're putting in your neck on the line in that situation. Yeah, how do I know that? Right, right. And, and, and you can't imagine the repercussions, like on a film, if you use something and it's not cleared, they can, like, take the movie out of the theaters. I mean, just imagine the financial Jeez. repercussions, right? That could be, you know, so the that's why, you know, we talk about the administrative part. So that's the most important. The creative part, sadly, for the people that are hiring you is secondary, you know. Yeah. So, you know, th there's that that whole thing. So gaining people's trust, they have to come in through relationships and things like that. Typically, you're not even going to get through the door. Right. Right. That's why like disco is a great thing, too, because if you send out music on disco, the music supervisors see that. Then they're going. Oh, they, they're going to think that you know more about sync because you're using the Premier Sync program. They're, it is, you know, they they might trust you more. You know right, what I mean? Right, right, right. And look, some music providers have very strict policies where they just don't take unsolicited material from independent artists, more or less. But they more, they, they, lay, they line that up specifically. I mean, they probably have interns that are out there like finding those kind of artists for them and right. stuff, or they're just strictly they only do such big projects that they have enough money to use only these kind of boutique companies that kind of vet for them uh, and bring them the independent artists, you know? Wild. That's wild. But because I'm a hood dude from Crenshaw and mm -hmm. I come from the streets, I like to help artists, and also because I've been working on a lot of reality shows and shows with smaller budgets, I haven't had much choice yeah. but to deal with independent artists. And mm -hmm. also just because I love to and I want to and it's in right. my nature. It's punish It can be punishing, though, because the artists that don't know anything about this make it so much harder for us, you know well, what I mean? My, my question, I guess, for that, I've... I've seen a, a, a recent kind of pushback on kind of categorizing everybody as an independent artist, right? There's some folks out here, shout out to, <laughs> shout out to Arson from Heat Makers. We had a long conversation about uh, whether or not the independent artist exists entirely, but in the scope of how we view these, this thing, there is a difference between up and comers and independent artists. Definitely. Right? There's up and comers who still kind of have one foot in, I'd love to be signed, another foot in, well, I'm, I'm playing the role of some of the things that I do are independent of representation, but um, I do feel like there is that difference between someone who's independent already has figured out this is my business structure. Mm -hmm. This is how we conduct business. There's a level of professionalism. There's a there's a system to what I'm doing, and um, for for those, I feel like that represents a good chunk of my audience. Is why they find so much value in what you're sharing with them. Yeah, those artists are a pleasure to deal with. You know, they're few and far between, though. I mean, sure. like, you know, m most of the independent artists that are, like, really looking at their their artistry as a business mm -hmm. have typically found, like, sync companies to rep their music often and stuff mm -hmm. like that because it's such an important, like, factor. Like I'm saying, if you're an independent artist or label or producer or manager or anything you know like the indie labels right now they're surviving off of like sing income into a lot mm. some of them a lot of them are you know and like i said there's a whole lane of independent artists that are just like making a living from their craft via sync mm -hmm. and that's really that's oh, the thing yeah 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 um so hmm. and and for those two th both of those artists sync is important but like i said it's different you know what i mean like mm -hmm. you know for people that are really already focused on being an independent artist and have put a lot into it and are starting to have like a little more success or things like that mm -hmm. totally focusing on sync might take them away from their goal um but having a sync strategy is going to be imperative to their success and also probably trying to uh, we've i think i mentioned kid cuddy earlier some artists that kind of made music for sync mm -hmm. um Oh, there was an artist the other day that was just talking about how they went and just made a whole project for sync and it was like really blew them up you know and they got all these big syncs you know mm. so and it, it's hard because it's like like I, I almost wonder what do you tell somebody how to make you know because like yeah, so when like, you try to do it it's like <laughs> but but it I never think, gets those looks but, but yeah. part of it is like topics like i said mm -hmm. so much of our music is about love and relationships mm -hmm. which is cool but so much of our cinematic music needs 
is not necessarily in those scenes. So lyrically, those songs take you out of it a lot of the times. Mm. So songs that have broader topics like... uh, they always talk about Kanye's power. I mean, that could be the divorced woman who just got the big settlement, walks out of the office. That could be wow. a million different kind of scenarios, right? right? It's a it's a it's a topic that has different meanings that could apply to it, like a relationship song where the hook is like clever and could mean other things, could be very syncable. See that 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 you you just dropped the bar. Right? Hold on, let me let me drop you a, a truth bomb right here. Look, look, you got one I, of those. I was, I was saying I better get one, man. Look, I, I got you. Either one, I'll give you another one. one. Another one. <laughs> I'll give you another one for that one. Because look, it was a failure if I didn't get one of those. No, so, you're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's two things that you said today I think that is so um, so practical that can be put into motion right now for anybody that's looking to get into sync. One of those is study what has already worked mm-hmm. because I, that's kind of what my mindset would do. Had I ne- not been able to meet you when I was looking from the outside in on these things, I would take these songs from like an insecure sure. and I would see what are the things that they have in common. That's kind of how I had to do it when I was talking to, you know, whoever was in charge of communicating what they needed in terms of the music for these ad companies. I, I knew they weren't going to get these answers. So I would utilize, um, websites that would instantly tell me what the key of this song was. I would see, mm. is there a BPM that they all have in common? Mm. But what you said about studying, that's number one. Second one, the point that you just made. Refresh me one more time. The point you just made right now about what was it we just talking about right now? I got so hyped because I got. I know the, you look. You got the you got the bomb. <laughs> but no, but uh, you were talking specifically about somebody remind me. Um, what was it that we just talking about? I got you know I got so hyped in doing it as well. But uh, nonetheless, these are things that you can put into motion right now. Uh, general topics. Oh, thank you so much. There you go. There it is. This idea All the topics. Of, yeah, the to- right, right, creating right. something that is not so specific. And I feel like mm-hmm. for the sake of art, to me, that doesn't compromise your art. Because when I think oh. of once again, like a like we brought the name Basquiat, he made something that now I see renditions of it as logos on the back of cars and things like this. And it's like it's it's so broad that it could mean something different for you. I, I just watched all the like upcoming action trailers. All they're using is these same old rock songs, man. It was like Black Pig. I, was, I mean, true, uh, true. Uh, uh, it was Led Zeppelin. It was like it was a, a, a Heart Barracuda. It was, yeah. It was all these songs, you know, these old songs. But I mean, there, there, there's, there's, um, there's a certain. Uh, I, I, I think. Look, if the topic can be. Like like Jimi Hendrix was on some surreal lyricism and stuff. So you, you purple haze that could mean weed, like that could mean anything, anything right? Yeah. Right. So I mean, like, and that's one of the reasons these old songs are so loved by filmmakers and stuff mm-hmm. like that. When you're talking about, you know, if you text me after three, uh, you know, it's just so specific. <laughs> you know, the topics are so like, you know, imagine you know, that in an eighties movie Snapchat, while texting. Me. You know, yeah. So I mean, and these, some of these things like really time themselves to or whatever. Wow. Like, they're so like trendy about things that are happening right now, or whatever. And, 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 and oftentimes the film things are like bigger themes, you know, because mm. it's like when you use music in film and TV well, you never want to be too dead on. Like you don't have a scene where the guy's driving down the street and talking about, I'm driving down the street, you know. But you know, you know what? Though? This, the 90s was notorious for some of those in the movies. Like, like, like but I, the, I'm a man on a, on a mission. I'm a menace in these streets. Like they would be so deliberate to where that, that's what makes a 90s movie, it, right? <laughs> Deliberate too, but also not like specific. Maybe lyric. It, it's, it's still a broader meaning. Right. They're not it describing worked, the color it of the clothes. Perfect. And, it, it, right, it, it hit right. the nail on the head. But but typically, like filmmakers that that I respect, that most people think use really great music, don't tend to hit the nail on the head as sure. much. You know what I mean? So it'll be a subtle. <laughs> but there'll be lyrics or something that are really relevant to a scene, but it right. won't be. A, a, a dead on the nose description of that scene, mm. right? That's what I mean. So, so I mean, I think creating music that where, especially the hook, um, has a more general topic that could maybe be applied to different things or whatever like that could be a really powerful tool, mm. uh, um, or could have alternate meanings. Like I said, it could be about a relationship or whatever. But if maybe those same words could also be, be reinterpreted to to, to, to to mean something else or whatever, you know. You scare me because this this sounds like the music I've been making, and and I have been like so. An- I shouldn't say anti. I have not been anti sync. I have just been introduced to it in a very 
the, a very, very one-sided way of things. And the more I talk to you, the more I understand not only the uh, the opportunity that could be out here for all the DIYers that are here, but uh, even for myself, because as a, as an independent artist, as an independent music producer, uh, streams of revenue are literally what we, mm. surpri- we, we we survive and thrive off of. So there's many different things, many different hats that I wear, but there's some times where I'm like, man, it would be nice to be able to have a bit of a nest egg or just something that is working while I'm sleeping. A passive income. Yeah, I mean, like I said, anyone that has a, a catalog of music that's uh, syncable, meaning that, you know, sample free, uh, assuming that you're either the producer or the artist, mm-hmm. and, and if you're not a 100 percenter, which is always great, but the other parties that created the music are also independent, not signed to publishing companies, and open to you know getting their music synced, mm-hmm. um, then 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 you're you're missing out on opportunity by not pursuing that, and 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 you really have to organize it like your man from Tumex said, like it's like you know having this music all over the place and everything, like you know, I mean. Uh, like no one's gonna know your catalog as good as you. Even if sure. like if I'm rep- repping it for sync, mm-hmm. like I'm probably like I I have mostly I work with producers and they have these massive catalogs. So I might get a need and I'll go to them and go, "What do you got for this?" And I already have an idea. Maybe well, I know you got that one artist song that's kind of mm-hmm. like this or that one thing. But what you got? Maybe you got something new I haven't heard or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the thing that we're trying to replace or this is the need or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. and depending on time frame. Where we get a lot of our placements are the producer go, yeah, I got something kind of like that, but it's like this, kind of like that. So I'm just going to make something right now mm-hmm. that's dead on what you're asking for. Mm-hmm. And then often we get it placed. You know, it's like tailor made for the thing or whatever. And when those things don't place, which happens, often that same song gets placed later because it's the kind of thing that's going to need anyway. And you're building up your catalog. So got it, got if it, you're got making, it. and it's something that you didn't have before, right? Because mm-hmm. if you had that identically that before, we would have just submitted what you had before. Mm-hmm. Um, clean versions. Clean versions. Eesh. Like, okay, if if you're serious about sync, you got the original version, of swear, assuming they're swearing in it. You got a clean version and you got an instrumental all readily available, mm-hmm. well labeled, and ready to be sent out on a dime. Yeah. Because when I need it, I might need it fast. Yeah. <laughs> and you, and you, you might send me something tomorrow, but John sent me something that today, and it was yours might be better, but his came first. Ugh. And sometimes Ooh. what came first might win. Because once we already. Okay, you're not going to get. I got, I got, look at that. You're going, going for four. I'm going to take as many as I can. Trifecta is done. Yeah, yeah. It's done. Here no, no, um, <laughs> I mean, once we get some place, we usually don't go back and go, oh, but I got this other thing that's better. You know, it's too late. I mean, I might for my homie if I'm trying. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. but it's like we're moving on. We got we got more shit to do. You know, when I'm when working on these TV shows, there's so many placements, so many songs. It's just mm-hmm. like sometimes I'm so excited. Oh, my, I've been trying to get my homie placement for so long. And then they cut it. I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah. But it is what it is. You know what I mean? Like, and it should be. I feel like what you're really what you're asking for is not a lot. You're asking for. If this is the profession you want to get into, approach it as a professional. Literally, just you're organizing it because these are things that are you're going to. And, and, and some folks, you cannot fault them for never experiencing it and right. never being told the information. But you're being told the information, right. the structure. Even Paul shared with you the uh, the titling scenario because I've seen Very people important. who've tried to game the system and oh, I'm going to call it this crazy thing and hope that it you know it stands out amongst everything else that's here and not that it can't work but they're not they're not thinking about the things that they've, they've actually been asked right. of them well one thing that people do especially with instrumental tracks is they'll name the track like dark tension or maybe not quite that but yeah, they'll yeah. they'll name the tension they'll name it something to describe what it is which can be good. Mm-hmm. In our mm-hmm. in our space can be helpful, you know. But yeah, no, I mean, um, I've been doing this for a long time, and it's sad how much it correlates. Like, I have my shit together, and my shit is really well prepared and organized and labeled, and it's mad generic, mm-hmm. and I don't have any of that together. But my shit is cool. But you know, my titling is really bad. You know, it's not you know it's not organized well. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's all over the place. It's you know. Um, so yeah, this is something that would really make 
our lives a lot easier mm-hmm. on my side of the fence when people have that part together. And most people just won't deal with you if you don't. So, you know what I mean? Like I said, <laughs> I'm a unique uh, uh, creature uh, right. for punishment, you know. And uh, and also because I do other things, you know, maybe I say, okay, look, we'll, we'll help you represent your music, so we're going to show you how to do it, and, right. and we're going to do it for you to some extent. Just give us the music, and we'll, mm-hmm. you know, we'll help handle that for you. Um, and so we help people with that. And, you know, but um, the biggest thing is having the quality of music and then the the, the diversity and quantity. Mm. Because, like, if all your music is kind of like one note or whatever, that might be cool for an artist, but it's probably not going to work that great in sync. But if you're really focused on the artist and your artist thing is going, that's okay, too. Because, I mean, the easiest way to get syncs is... Back in the day, it would be like get on KCRW, right? Mm. Now, maybe get on that right playlist or something. But like the music supervisors either listen or have young people listening to the cool, buzzing music that's going on out there. So if you can make any kind of buzz on your music in the real world, that's the easiest way to get syncs. Mm. But that's hard as fuck. You know, obviously, right. that's that, <laughs> that so no, much, that so no, much to pay attention to. Right, that ain't now. no easy yeah. thing to do. And so, and many of the people that get syncs don't get there, yeah. but they get good at figuring out how to get syncs. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then there's and there's plenty of artists too that have really used syncs to really elevate their career. Yeah. So, like I said, independent artists, up and coming, bedroom artists, it doesn't really matter which space you're in. Mm-hmm. Uh, sync can be a. a a way for you to earn some money from your music. If if if, yeah. you, if you're looking at it any way outside of a hobbyist, and obviously you're on this channel, so you are. You know what I mean. So if you're not just doing it just for the hell of it, you know what I mean. Then you know if you have any kind of like game plan to make mm-hmm. money, mm-hmm. sync is just too big of a space to ignore. Um, I mean, and there's a lot of subpar artists that are doing pretty well in it because they figured that's, out all of this other stuff that's very the part well. That blows my mind is that when I see some people like I'll get I'll get Instagram will randomly suggest someone who just got, you know, and not hating on them or nothing like no, that, yeah, but yeah. it's like I listen to it and I'm like, what was that brief? Because it's like all about three or four instruments in this whole beat, and it's just like the mixing, like every, everything top to bottom just sounds like. Well, look, okay, first of all, well, hold on. Well, hold on, first of all. We're hip hop guys. Yeah. And so when we're talking about hip hop, too, you know, you got to understand the music supervisor was probably, you know, Leslie um, (laughs) Nuremberg. I'm not. No, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. I'm not trying to get racial or nothing. You're obviously white. You know, I. I, I got but some, we we get the reference right, because right. I, I, I you know I we, we come a lot across of people those. that are out of touch with yeah. with with hip hop music that are making these judgments. So you hear this crazy stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes in there, and they might boy they might know the hell out about some Smiths or some you know whatever some white people stuff. You know what I mean? But then yeah. when it comes to hip hop, they don't they don't understand it. it some the the unmixed thing that right. somebody did sounds as good to them as Drake. They don't <laughs> they don't know. You know what I mean? Or or oh, or, or or or, or yeah. Or Jay Z or Cole or anybody, you know what I'm saying? Do, or do they ever get penalized for making these decisions like that? Like, how do you know? How do you gauge a successful uh, uh, a sync decision from? Like, how would they? How would someone gauge I, that? I mean, I look, I, I, I can't. It's a tough question to ask, but I remember yeah. I worked on this BET show and. Um, it was called Cop Watch, and it, it came out right before the Black Lives Matter, man. The timing was bad. Oh, wow. They were, like, watching cops, you know? Yeah, yeah. It was people that watch cops for, you know. And um, the, the production company, who I really enjoyed working for, would love to work for again, uh, Critical Content was a very white, very big reality TV company. And when they booked this gig, it was through BET, and they're like, oh, we better, we got to get a little cooler for our music than this. And so they hired me, and I was giving the editors all this music, but they were cutting with the same library reality music mm-hmm. that they were used to using. And the network fired their asses up. But they were like, this is some white shit, this EDM <laughs> shit. We ain't fucking with this. Like, you know. So I had to save them by, but I also had to figure out what their needs, what the editors' mm-hmm. needs were. Mm-hmm. And all the instrumental hip hop tracks I had weren't necessarily nailing all those needs. So then I had producers started making stuff that was cooler, more mm. urban, but also was kind of reality TV-ish for the editors, you know? So kind of like, I'm saying, listening to what's working and kind mm. of understanding of how I can do that or maybe how I can do that a little cooler yeah, yeah. Is, is a great way to, or how I can put my own slant on on what is happening right now too. You That's know? huge. 
Yeah. I see what you're, well, as as we bring this to a close, man, I first of all, round of applause uh, to, to Paul Stewart. I mean, the, the amount of gems that you have already given, and yeah, the amount of gems you've already given, I think, are enough for my audience to mull over for a good amount of time. But you and I have been talking about yes. the prospect of being able to actually help specifically uh, producers in this community. And uh, I know my content has pivoted. I know a lot of the stuff that I do. And I, 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 you know, I clown sometimes about the craziness that goes on in this producer community. But nonetheless, I always have, um, it's my first love is I still produce, but uh, there's so many of you that want to get into sync and i brought you shout out to uh clinton music and uh or clint music and, and exposing you guys to that and i'm glad that some of you have taken advantage of that opportunity but you know with someone like paul who is currently doing all of these things that requires him having the ear i would love there to be some kind of an opportunity i don't know what specifically that looks like right. and even what specifically you already offer but uh, i would love to leave them with um Oh, we something got, on that. Oh, we got to do it. No, I think, mm -hmm. um, like we were saying before, man, I mean, uh, sync is a really important strategy for independent artists, You, even more for producers. Um, you have a great pool of people that are like, you know, in that space. You know, I both uh, consult people and teach them kind of the secret sauce of how to, you know, get ahead of mm -hmm. the industry. I said some great things today, but you know, there's a lot more we didn't even get a chance to get into. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, also help take on people's music and help shop it for yeah. sync. So between those things, I'm sure there's things that we can set up for your audience. Man, um, you hear that? Y'all hear that? Y'all yeah. hear that? Oh, one more bomb. One more bomb. So, can't just you can't just drop that kind of stuff around here. No, you know? I'm, I'm I'm excited, man. Like I said, I'm a fan. I mean, I, I discovered your channel about uh, I think about when did you have the 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 uh, singer on who was a a pop alternative pop singer and she was also talking about the expenses of touring. She was a content oh, creator. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a uh, Dev Lemons. Dev Lemons. Dev Lemons. That yeah. was the first video of yours wow. I saw. Uh, and then after that, I think I saw it like when it came out pretty new. I've been yeah. watching ever since, like reg crazy. regularly. I went back and watched, checked out a few old things. But yeah. no, nah, man, I really, uh, uh, I really enjoy uh, what you're doing. I'm excited to hear the music from your community. Man, uh, I, I heard one track already that was really impressive. You know, and uh, I think we can do some great things um, together. Definitely. I'm excited for it, man. This is the Definitely. first of many. First of many. Come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so DIYers, thank you now. Now that you're performing a legitimately awesome service, Curtis King. I, I am grateful just to be a vessel. I'm grateful that um, legendary individuals like Paul Stewart are reaching out and saying, hey, no, there's an opportunity not just um, for myself, but I feel like there's an opportunity that your community could benefit off of. My thing has always been very consistent in that if I cannot give you the information about something specifically, I'm going to find the people who can or thankfully sometimes, thank God, they come find me. And in that position, we're able to align with each other and present these opportunities to you. So all I'll say is this, DIYers, DIYers, um, shout out to all of you that have hung out. Um, someone said the other day, oh, yeah, 300 people in here today. But, you know, it, it's, it's you know, less than 100 today. But I'm like, you can't look at it like that. This is specifically shout out to my guy, Stevie Crooks, an, an amazing artist. He, he says. Um, this song that I'm making right now is a custom experience. It's mm. not intended for everybody. He mm. said this is meant to activate a certain person. You know who you are. That's how I feel about this type of content. If this if everybody was doing it, it would make it very challenging for those of you that truly have a passion for this to find and make your way. So I'm grateful that you're here, especially on a Saturday on, on short notice. Uh, but stay tuned because I, I know that this is not the last time you and I will be having this conversation. Not and uh, I love the fact that you have, have gone to bat for independent artists and these projects. And there's so many artists that even when I, I keep referring to Insecure, but what I love specifically about that one was that there was so much music and like I say it's a collaborative effort with you and Issa Rae and shout out to Issa Rae. Um, but having these artists that are like, damn, I thought I was the only one that had this on my playlist mm. or I thought I was the, it was like a really original thing mm. and, and, and having that go all over the world and this be, you know, something that people have on, you know, uh, Netflix or DVDs or wherever they're kind of re re-watching and stuff. 
it's just an amazing thing. You've given me a whole other perspective on sync today and the last conversation we had. Oh yeah. Because man, I'm telling you the Oh, you're sleeping of, on it. No, we I know I, I am. mean no you 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 came I am, in, I've been snoring on it because of how pissed off they no, had me. You you came in the game in the most <laughs> there, there's different segments and the segment sure. you came in is probably not one you want to participate in. Mm. You know what I mean? Because it's it's too much of that back and forth and these people they don't know what they're talking about and it's very frustrating. But mm -hmm. You know, the, the other segments are, that's the only one that's really like that. That's the only one that's okay. controlled by the ad agencies and, and, and these people, you know what yeah. I mean? And then the clients who are the brands and everything. And, you know, people are just really far removed from music. But, no, we're going to get your catalog up and cracking. Let's, let's get let's get your audience, <laughs> you know, cracking. And uh, I need more better music, man. And, and, and I'm excited to hear the stuff you. that, that your people are working on, you know. Hold and, on. Do, uh, do I have that clip? Hold on. Hold on. Where, where is it at? But I am telling you. We have some of the greatest music that you're going to hear. I listen to it every Monday. We have this segment. And we'll, it'll, be, it'll be amazing at some point, even if I need to travel out, out your way uh, to do a Critique My Beats mm. episode that is specifically for uh, Sync. Yeah, we got to get you in Crenshaw, man. Big shout out that'd to Haroon Coffee in Lamert Park. And, should we uh, even, I mean, I, I don't mm. know what the extent of that, but that would be amazing to even oh, do a stream from. We should. That would be a wild. Thurs does a lot of things there. You yeah. can look that up anytime. Okay, well, let me connect yeah. with Thurs because yeah. that would be that would be amazing. I think you guys would, especially those who want to get into it, you would get some really amazing gems. But thank you once again for your time. Thank you once again for the information. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Any final words or ways they can stay connected to you? Uh, yeah, well, salute to you and your audience. Uh, Instagram, I'm not on Twitter or X, so, uh, but Paul underscore DJP underscore Stuart. Uh, S T E W A R T on Instagram. I do check my messages there. Uh, that's really my only social media app. I mean, I got Facebook, but oof, you leave me a message there, man. <laughs> I write you back three years later, like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't same, know. Same, same. But same. Uh, yeah, but no, man, I definitely, um, yeah, you know, reach out. Uh, and I'm excited about, you know, stay tuned to the things that we're going to work on together because yes, we got some big things coming together. It's, it's going to be great. I, I had this plan before I even met him. So. <laughs> Now he's coming on but board. I, look, and yeah. I gotta say this just just about your 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 demeanor, your just who you are. Like everybody that I know, don't mess with nobody that's about no nonsense. You've been like, yes, yeah, that's, that's my friend. I, they 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 vouch for, for you, and I'm like, not that that's that's a necessity because your name is your name, but I think even the way that you approach me for the first time, somebody in this space did not approach me, and it felt like. You treat me like a funnel right now. Mm. I love the fact that you were like, these are the facts. These are what's going on. But also, here's where I think that you might have viewed this from a different lens. I, I appreciate you for that. because, And this is something I wasn't planned. I genuinely appreciate that because um, if they, which I'm sure there is money left there. There's an abundance of music that I... Uh, you know, I, I'm not excited about pushing it to streaming. I am excited right. about getting it actually sold. But... Uh, what you're saying makes so much sense, and I think it is time for me to really uh, uh, make that pivot and, 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 and get into that. But that's not happening unless you're the person that you are. So I, I appreciate the human being so much more today. So right, thank, thank you. Thank you, man. Well, it was all my pleasure, man. Shout out to the community. Absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this will stay up here live. I have all the information that you need down there in the description. Thank you all so much. Make sure that you share it if you found some information. Very, very valuable. I will see you very soon, DIYers. And as always, have a good one. Stay productive. Stay safe. Make some great music, and I'll be at you soon. All right? Talk to you soon. Uh, tomorrow, Triz is joining me for the first episode of our podcast. Oh, you didn't know about that, huh? Really indie, though. Let's talk about it tomorrow.